In today's program, teacher Richard Hallows will be here with some more help and advice to make us better speakers. I think you need to practice a little. And I think you need to practice often. Don't do lots and lots of pronunciation practice, but just be aware. Just do a little bit now and again. English is used as an international language in many different areas. Sport is one. When a football manager from Korea, Park Han Suk, had to speak to a worldwide audience about football supporters in his country, he did so in English. He explains that people in Korea like football very much, but they like to watch it at home on television. Koreans, he says, don't like to go and see a match live in a football stadium. They prefer to stay at home, have a picnic, or go with friends to have a drink. In the hearts of the Korean people, they like football very much more than yeah, baseball and, and basketball. But actually, uh, they do not want to uh, visit a stadium. Even if Korean people like football very much, sometimes they want to uh, go another place. Like picnic or do other things at home. Maybe、uh, Korean people like drinking so much. Maybe if a person is asked to,、uh, yeah, whether you go to the stadium or you join the, your friends uh, uh, in the, maybe a、uh, beer shop, something like that,、uh, I think uh, maybe uh, uh, Korean people choose the,、uh, going to the beer shop. I don't know. <laughs> Park Han Suk is someone who's overcome his fears of speaking English to the point where he can talk to an international audience in the language. But what's he doing that makes him such an effective user of the language? What's his secret to better speaking? BBC Learning English dot com. And with me again in the studio is teacher and teacher trainer Richard Hallows. Hello, Richard. Hi, Callum. And this week you've been listening to Korean football manager Park Han Suk. Here he is again. In the hearts of the Korean people, they like football very much more than yeah, baseball and, and basketball. But actually,、uh, they do not want to、uh, visit a stadium. Even if Korean people like football very much, sometimes they want to、uh, go another place, like picnic or do other things at home. Maybe、uh, Korean people like drinking so much. Maybe if a person is asked to,、uh, yeah, whether you go to the stadium or you join the, your friends uh, uh, in the, maybe a beer shop, something like that,、uh, I think uh, maybe uh, uh, Korean people choose the,、uh, going to the beer shop. I don't know. <laughs> that was Park Han Suk, a football manager from Korea, there talking about crowds. Now, Richard. How successful is this person as a speaker of English as an international language? I think he's very successful because he's using the few words he knows in a very effective way.、Um, if I can draw your attention to the example of beer, beer shop. Maybe、uh, Korean people like drinking so much. Maybe if a person is asked to,、uh, yeah, whether you go to the stadium or you join the, your friends.、Uh, Uh, in a maybe a beer shop, something like that. He uses、uh, this word. It's not correct English, but we understand what he wants to say. The correct English is、um, liquor store in America, and in Britain we would say off license. But beer shop is perfectly understandable. We know what he wants to say, so he's using his words in a very effective way. And I think this is a good, a good piece of advice for our listeners. So even if you don't know exactly the right word, you can still use other words to get your meaning across clearly. Yeah, it's better to、um, explain your way around the word. You use the words you have.、Mm, for example, let, let me see if you can、um, guess some words I'm, I'm telling you. Okay, I'm driving my car, and suddenly I have a. Oh, you know when when the air comes out of the tire, there's a bang, and the air.、Oh, comes... Now that's a, a, a puncture. Okay, so I didn't need to use that word. You understood me perfectly well. Maybe、um, okay. What do you call the thing that、um, you know? I want to clean my teeth. Oh, it'd be a, a toothbrush. Okay, so there we are. It's very simple. It doesn't have to be a very complicated thing. So not knowing the exact word in English is not really a big problem for communication. No, absolutely. So he deals with vocabulary very well, but if he were your student,、uh, what things would you like him to work on? Okay, I think. 
you know, I think um, Park Han Suk is is very understandable, but I think we could improve his pronunciation a little bit. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the sentence stress that he uses. So by sentence stress, I'm talking about when you um, make a sentence, where does the stress go in the in the sentence? So the strong part of the word. Exactly. It's not. It's very even. Uh, with uh, Park Han Suk, every word is stressed the same. This can be a problem because it can sometimes affect the um, the meaning of what you want to say. If I give you a sentence, see if you can work out what the important part of the information is. What what am I trying to tell you? For example, if I tell you, mm, Callum, I've got um, I've got this big black cat. Well, it's not a small cat; it's a, a big cat because you stressed big. Yeah. yeah. Now I could say mm, I've got a big black cat. Ah, so the colour, this time you've stressed the colour, yeah. so it's not a white cat. It's, it's a, not a brown cat, it's... A black cat. Exactly. Or I could even say, I've got a big black cat. So you've got a cat and not uh, a dog. So it's the same words, but by putting the stress on a different place, you, you change the meaning, really. Yeah. Now, you've got to be aware of different stress patterns in your language, and by knowing the differences... This is going to help you, you know, to work out what you need to focus on, where, where the differences lie, and what you need to do to make yourself more understandable. And it's not only just uh, in, in sentences that stress is important as well, it's also in, in individual words? Yeah, again, uh, Park Han Suk says um, they like football. In the hearts of the Korean people, they like football very much. He puts the stress on ball, it should be on foot, football. And so, again, this makes not just the word difficult to understand, but the whole phrase becomes quite difficult. So I suppose the problem is then that uh, if you use the stress pattern from your own language into English, it might not be the same and it might cause uh, some problems for, for understanding, possibly. Yeah, so, so again, in Korean, the stress pattern here is very even. And so you need to be aware of that and to see the differences. Uh, a different language might have a stress pattern where, for example, um, the ends of words are stressed much more than English. So you need to see how you, know, how you need to change that. And have you got any advice or tips for students to, to help them with this? OK. When you learn a new word, don't just think about learning the word. There's so much more information you need to, to add to that. An important thing is um, checking the stress a good dictionary will always tell you the stress. So when you learn that word, learn the stress. Mark it in your notebooks. Yeah, show, underline the syllable or mark it on top of something, but mark the stress. When, when you learn a word, it's a good idea to say it out loud with very exaggerated, with very strong stress. So, for example, if I was learning the word, I don't know, um, television, yeah, I might say, television television. So I really exaggerate it so that I can remember it. It's all about remembering. Um, I think you need to practice a little and I think you need to practice often. Don't do lots and lots of pronunciation practice, but just be aware, just do a little bit now and again. And maybe if you can, try recording your speaking or have another person listen to you and get some advice from them. That's a very good tip there. Richard Hallows, thank you very much. BBCLearningEnglish.com Richard talked there about what to do if you want to say something but you don't know the word or phrase in English or you've simply forgotten it. He said that you need to talk your way around the unknown word by using words that you do know, just like Park Han Suk did with his use of the expression beer shop. This is something that Rafael from Spain has also discovered as he's learned to become a more fluent speaker of English. As a non-native speaker, you, your vocabulary sometimes is not as good as you, you like to be. So, um, in, you know, there are many terms that you don't know when, when, you, when you want to express something and you don't know the right word for it, you tend to just go around and trying to explain, explain it using different uh, sentences and, and trying to define how that thing is used for in which way it is used. And another thing we do, at least as Spanish, we, do, we use our hands a lot as well and the face and everything. I mean, suddenly the whole body, body language becomes an integral part of the explanation. And all of that, just to say a simple word. Better speaking means better communication. And if it means using body language as well as your voice, then that's as much a part of English as it is in any language. And now just time to hear today's better speaking tips again.
When you hear native speakers speaking English, notice how certain important words are stressed in a sentence. Think about how English sentence stress is different from the sentence stress in your own language. When you meet a new word and you write it down in your vocabulary book, don't forget to mark the stress. Which syllable is stressed in the word? If you're not sure, look in a good learner's English dictionary. The stress will be shown in there. You can practice word stress by saying the word and repeating it, giving the stressed syllable exaggerated emphasis. For example, vocabulary. Vocabulary. If you're speaking English and you can't think of the right word, don't stop or stumble. Explain your way around the word you don't know by using words that you do know. This week, we continue our series, Better Speaking, presented by Callum Robertson and featuring interviews with Richard Hallows. Try to imagine what globalization can possibly mean to half of humanity that has never made or received a phone call. The simple fact of the matter is this. If we cannot make globalization work for all, in the end it will work for none. Kofi Annan using English to talk about globalization. In the program today, Richard Hallows is with me again to look at Kofi Annan's use of English and give us some more advice on becoming better speakers. He's interacting with us. Try to imagine. He's asking us to do something. If you find it difficult to speak English fluently and would like some help to become more confident and maybe one day use English as effectively as Kofi Annan, then this series, Better Speaking, is for you. Kofi Annan is from Ghana in West Africa, and as we've just heard, he uses English as an international language in a highly effective way. In this excerpt from a speech on globalization, he's asking his listeners to make sure that the process of economic globalization helps everybody in the world, the poor as well as the rich. It is a much tougher sell out there in a world where half of our fellow human beings struggle to survive on less than two dollars a day. Try to imagine what globalization can possibly mean to half of humanity that has never made or received a phone call. The simple fact of the matter is this. If we cannot make globalization work for all, in the end it will work for none. Even though he's making a speech, which is a style of English that is quite formal and, and has been carefully prepared, he's still using his spoken language skills to communicate with his audience. But what can we learn from him? What's his secret to better speaking? BBCLearningEnglish.com And with me again in the studio is teacher and teacher trainer Richard Hallows. Hello, Richard. Hello, Callum. And you've been listening this week to Kofi Annan. Let's hear him again. It is a much tougher sell out there in a world where half of our fellow human beings struggle to survive on less than two dollars a day. Try to imagine what globalization can possibly mean to half of humanity that has never made or received a phone call. The simple fact of the matter is this. If we cannot make globalization work for all, in the end it will work for none. So, Richard, how successful do you think Kofi Annan is as a speaker of English as an international language? Of course, he's really successful, isn't he? I think what's interesting here is the way that he's, I mean, he's making a speech. It's very, very interesting, the language he uses. He uses language to make us want to listen. Sometimes he uses alternative words. So maybe sometimes he refers to people as human beings. And then another time, rather than repeat that word, he says humanity in a world where half of our fellow human beings struggle to survive on less than two dollars a day. Try to imagine what globalization can possibly mean 
to half of humanity that has never made or received a phone call. So he's putting variety into his vocabulary. Mm, mm. He's also um, he's interacting with us. He's he's asking us uh, asking us to do something. So when he's speaking, he says, "Try to imagine." Da, 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 da. So we're all like, you know, we start thinking, and oh yes, it's something for us to do. Try to imagine what globalization can possibly mean to half of humanity that has never made or received a phone call. So the listener is being. Involved in the speech in this case,、mm, exactly. He makes his speech stronger. There's one example. He could say the fact is, but he doesn't. He says the simple fact of the matter is. So he's making it stronger. The simple fact of the matter is this,、yeah, which is again a nice way of you know making people listen, and it's generally quite a dramatic kind of way of speaking,、it's、contrasting words like all with none and and things like that. It's very interesting. If we cannot make globalization work for all, in the end, it will work for none. This was probably a scripted、uh, speech by Kofi Annan. Sure, I mean, obviously, you can't you can't script a conversation, but you can predict things that you often talk about with one particular person. Now, I went to、uh, Spain for the weekend the other day. I saw my my Spanish friend Jon, and、uh, I always talk to him about football. He's a big football fan. Now, I needed to think of the type of vocabulary I needed. I mean, I know these words, but I need to review them in my head. What kind of words do you need to talk about football? What, what do you think, Callum? Well, I mean, in English, you tell me in English. Yes,、uh, I mean, I mean, there'll be footballing words. For example, things like goal,、uh, draw, shoot, result,、uh, kick. Yeah, I was. You know, reviewing these words in my head, so I'm preparing. So when I talk to him, it's much better, it's much easier, and I speak much more fluently, and I communicate more effectively. So certain subjects will have like certain vocabulary that you know is likely to be part of that conversation, that part of topic, and, and if you prepare yourself, think about those words, then you know it's going to help you in your conversation. Yeah, exactly. Kofi Annan is obviously a very, very competent speaker and communicator in English, but if we really wanted to be Picky. Is there anything that、uh, we could say to improve his English? Okay, there, there may be maybe a small pronunciation point we we could look at.、Um, he says、uh, at one point he says less than two dollars a day, but instead of less, he says less. In a world where half of our fellow human beings struggle to survive on less than two dollars a day. And there's an, another sentence. He says, "Has never made or received a phone call," but he doesn't say "has." He says "has." Half of humanity that has never made or received a phone call. So there's a confusion here of sounds z and s at the end of words. But is that really a, a big problem here? Well, I mean, no. Usually, the context makes it very clear. Anyway, I mean, there there could be a confusion between peace and peas, but I think I think the the context is clear, isn't it?、Yeah. Um, there are lots of other words where one、uh, sound can change the meaning, and the s and z example, for example, rice and rise,、mm. or、um, loose and lose, or、um, advice and advise. So, in in some circumstances, that that difference between that s and that z sound can make a completely new word, which、yeah. uh, which which can alter alter the meaning. And the, and there are times when you know we use this z sound quite a lot in English. We when we're talking about possession, we use the apostrophe s, which is a z sound, like、um, John's car, for example,、mm. not John's car,、mm. and Richard's. Advice exactly. You can also extend this idea to think about how one sound, you know, within within a word, not necessarily at the end, can change the word from one meaning to another meaning to another meaning. It's very it happens a lot in English.、Um, bit, bat, but, you know, it's just one small change. Or、um, C and she, or boat and vote. You know, this can be cause problems of communication. So you know, it's quite important to recognise. The the problems that or the differences between your language and English. 
So, Richard, on these points of pronunciation, do you have any advice that you could pass on to our listeners? Yeah, um, one uh, important piece of advice is that you need to be able to recognise a sound before you can actually produce it. If you can't hear it, then you can't make it. Now, to illustrate this point, I've brought along one of my students. Uh, this is Benjamin. Hello, Benjamin. Hello. What we will do is Benjamin will listen to me saying some words. The words have two different sounds, either sh or ch. So Benjamin will listen to the words and he will tell me number one if it's sh and number two if it's ch. You might want to try this yourself at home. OK? Are you ready, Benjamin? Yes. OK. The first one, ship. Number one. Good. Chip. Two. Cherry. Two. Sherry. Number one. Shoes. Number one. Choose. Two. Washing. One. Watching. Two. Watching. Two. Ooh, nearly got you there. Very good. <laughs> OK, so we can do these kind of exercises and um, he can now start to... You know, hear the difference, and he knows that he needs to hear the difference. Now we can move on from this, and he can practice saying the words to me. So now here's Benjamin. He will read the words, and I will say one or two. So we'll see if he can now produce the words. Okay, Benjamin. Uh, uh, ship. One. Watching. Two. Um, shoes. One. Match. Two. Show. One. <laughs> Very good. So you can see how you move from recognition, first of all, you know, hearing the sound, and then producing the sound. Now, there are other things you, you need to think about, like um, the position of your tongue, uh, the position of your lips, seeing how you, how you make the sound physically with your mouth. Those things are quite uh, difficult to tell. How can you help? One thing you can do with the lips is to um, use a mirror. It sounds a bit silly, but if you hold a mirror and you look at yourself making the sound, you can see the shape, the shape of your lips. Now, again, you can get books which show you the correct position and, and the correct position of your tongue. If, if you can't get that, it's better to, you know, work with another person and see if you can correct each other. So for, for those pieces of advice, Richard, thank you very much. Thank you. And Benjamin, thank you very much for coming in. Bye. Before we go today, if you didn't quite catch all those tips that Richard gave us, don't worry, here's a chance to hear them again. If you're speaking to a group of people and you want to hold their attention, try to add variety to the language you use and learn some useful phrases for interacting with your listeners and holding their attention. If you know that you'll be talking about a particular subject or topic, then prepare in advance some of the words and phrases that you might need. If there are particular English sounds that you find difficult to say, Listen out for these sounds when you're listening to good speakers of English. After you can recognise these difficult sounds, then you'll be able to make these sounds yourself. Use a mirror to watch your lips and help you make the right sounds. Or work with a partner and correct each other. If you find it difficult to speak English and would like some help to become more fluent, then better speaking is for you. Well, obviously I've survived in business by uh, being able to speak English and Greek, which is not very useful outside Greece. So definitely English must be the, the business language. Businessman Stelios Hadjiwanu has become well known here in Britain as the founder of a highly successful independent airline. In this interview, he explains why he chose to start his business in Britain and not in his home country, Greece. Well, obviously, I've survived in business by uh, being able to speak English and Greek, which is not very useful outside Greece. So definitely English must be the, the business language. I think it would have been impossible to run an airline in the UK without speaking English. That would have been serious limitation to, to your ability to communicate with customers. And in fact, when people ask me, uh, do you, uh, I mean, you come from Greece, why didn't you start the airline in Greece or why did you go to France or Germany or everything else? And, 
one of the things I say is that you know, Greece is too small, is in the wrong end of, of, of Europe. Um, and out of the big markets, the German, the French, and the English, the only language I could skip, uh, speak was English, so I, I had to come to London. Stelios needs English to run his business, and, as we heard there, he speaks the language very well. But what's he doing that makes him such a good communicator in English? What's his secret to better speaking? BBCLearningEnglish.com And with me again in the studio is teacher and teacher trainer Richard Hallows. Hello, Richard. Hello, Callum. And before we hear more from Richard, let's listen again to Stelios. Well, obviously I've survived in business by uh, being able to speak English and Greek, which is not very useful outside Greece. So definitely English must be the, the business language. I think it would have been impossible to run an airline in the UK without speaking English. That would have been serious limitation to, to your ability to communicate with customers. And in fact, when people ask me, uh, do you, uh, I mean, you come from Greece, why didn't you start the airline in Greece? Or why did you go to France or Germany or everything else? And one of the things I say is that, you know, Greece is too small, is in the wrong end of, of, of Europe. Um, and out of the big markets, the German, the French and the English, the only language I could skip, uh, speak was English, so I, I had to come to London. So, Stelios Hadjuanu there, obviously a very successful businessman, but Richard, how successful do you think he is as a speaker of international English? I think he's very successful, and I, I think one thing, what I find particularly interesting about Stelios is the way that he organises his speaking. And what do you mean by that? Well, he makes it very easy for us to follow what he wants to say. He uses words like and and but very well. But, but more than that, listen to the way he asks a question to himself and then goes on to answer that question. And in fact, when people ask me, uh, do you, uh, I mean, you come from Greece. Why didn't you start the airline in Greece? Or why did you go to France or Germany or everything else? And one of the things I say is that, you know, Greece is too small, is in the wrong end of, of, of Europe. And out of the big markets, the German, the French and the English, the only language I could skip, uh, speak was English, so I, I had to come to London. Now, um, by asking uh, the question, it prepares us, as being the listener, to um, listen for the answer. So, why did he come to the UK? Well, mm, I wonder. And, you know, we start thinking, oh, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. And then, then he gives us the answer. So, it's a good way to, to get the listener to, to follow easily what you want to, um, them to hear. And so, help, helping the listener out uh, in, you know, in the conversation. Yeah. And I think um, what our listeners can do is they can, you know, they can actually steal this question or adapt it in, in different ways. Uh, for example? Well, um, they could say, an interesting question is, and then go on to, to, to say that, or I think, da, 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 um, let me tell you about, is, is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a good expression. So there are ways of drawing the listener into the conversation, mm. getting them involved and, and making them want to listen more. Yeah, it's a way of um, marking uh, that there's some important information coming next. Um, it's a useful idea to, to make it clear, as clear as possible, what type of information is coming next. So um, I think if you're adding extra information or maybe contrasting information, saying something opposite in meaning. We, uh, our listeners know, I think, to say and and but, but maybe we can make that even clearer. How? Well, um, instead of just saying and, maybe and another thing is. Mm -hmm. Or um, and on top of that... Or, or maybe even just stressing and. So, for example, Stelios speaks very fluently and organises it very well. So we can stress the and to make it very clear that there's some extra information coming. And, and that's very natural. That's very natural indeed. I th you know, native speakers do it all the time. Um, if you're contrasting information, instead of saying just but, maybe, but in fact, mm -hmm. or um, but on the other hand, and so we know it's very clear there's some um, contrasting information coming, and listen for that information. Little phrases like, and another thing is, and on top of that are unnatural uh, markers to put into, into sentences. Can you, can you give us some examples of these? OK, um, so um, learning English is about having enough language, and on top of that, making our speaking clear through good organisation. Right, so th there's two things going on there, and on top of that uh, mm. indicates that there's something more as well that uh, needs to be listened out for. An example of contrasting information might be that um, I came here by bus today and, and I left my house very early. I thought it would take a long time. But in fact, 
it took me 20 minutes. So, in fact, used there to, to contrast mm. in, information. That's mm. a, a very natural kind of language. Mm. Um, Stelios, as we said, is a very natural speaker of English. Uh, let's listen to one more clip from him, and, and he's got his own piece of advice uh, for uh, learners and speakers of, uh, of English. Let's listen again. What I find fascinating is sometimes when you, you're having perhaps even a, a casual meeting, even a dinner with a group of uh, people from different countries where you know, the only common link really is business and you try and talk outside the business and, and, and then there's very little common ground. So um, one of the things I've learned is that um, if you're going to, to communicate with people whose mother tongue is not English, don't try and use too many colloquial expressions, don't try and crack too many jokes, because it may go over their head completely and you may lose them. So what do you think of that piece of uh, advice uh, uh, there, Richard? I know that many students, they like to learn idioms and colloquial expressions from uh, British English or American English, but uh, there's a little warning there from Stelios, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're right. Students do like learning idioms, and I think it can be fun, but I think you can spend a lot of time learning these idioms. And if you're speaking with non-native speakers, maybe it's not the best way to spend your time. Maybe they're not really going to be understood. So if you're speaking to native speakers, then, then, then that's quite a natural thing. But mm. other non-native speakers of English yeah. might, might not exactly uh, understand what you mean when you use these uh, idioms and, yeah. and jokes. Better to keep it simple, really simple and clear. Mm -hmm. So if we go back now to, to thinking about helping um, people who may be wanting to improve their English, um, what piece of advice uh, can you give them today? Well, first of all, um, be aware that you need to organise your speaking, which hopefully people are now. Um, and I think listen for ways in which people organise their speaking. So next time you're listening, don't just listen to the content, but listen how it's put together. OK, if you can read an interview or maybe if you've got a course book, look at the, the transcript of the, the listening in the back of the book and pick out ways in which the, uh, the, the speaking is organised. OK, um, look at the way people add information, the way they contrast information, the way they introduce new ideas or maybe interrupt other people and so on. The way it's organised very generally. So there's more than just and and but. Exactly, yes. And what about that uh, last piece of advice uh, about using colloquial expressions, idioms and jokes and so on? Yeah, I think using colloquial expressions, idioms can be very nice if you're speaking with a native speaker. If you're speaking with non-natives, maybe these things will not be understood, will make you not very clear. So when you're learning English, maybe focus, concentrate your time more on learning other things and focus on speaking as clearly and as simply as possible. For today, Richard Hallows, thank you very much. Thank you, Callum. And now, just time to hear today's Better Speaking Tips again. Listen out for ways that people organise what they're going to say. Listen to how good speakers of English add information. For example, they might say, and another thing is... Or perhaps they might say, and on top of that... Or they might just stress the word, and... Stelios speaks very fluently and organises it very well. So we can stress the and to make it very clear that there's some extra information coming. Listen to how speakers of English contrast information. For example, by saying, but in fact, or by saying, on the other hand, I came here by bus today and, and I left my house very early. I thought it would take a long time, but in fact, it took me 20 minutes. Notice the way fluent speakers introduce new ideas or new information. For example, they might say, an interesting question is, or let me tell you about... Remember the way that Stelios asked a question and then went on to answer it himself. And in fact, when people ask me, uh, do you, uh, I mean, you come from Greece, why didn't you start the airline in Greece, or why didn't you go to France or Germany or everything else? And one of the things I say is that, you know, Greece is too small, isn't it? If you're studying English at school or college and you have a course book, there may be transcripts of listening material in the book. If there are, read them and highlight the phrases that speakers use to add information, contrast information, 
introduce new ideas, and so on. Look at the, the transcript of the, the listening in the back of the book and pick out ways in which the, uh, the, the speaking is organised. So when everybody really, really liked debut, I was like, oh, but that's not, I can do much better than that, you know? So when I did post, for me, it's the sort of same concept, it, only I did it much better. Icelandic singer Björk using English to talk about her albums. I'll be talking to trainer Richard Hallows and looking at what makes Björk such a good speaker of English as an international language. There's a very interesting theory where if you choose one person that you want to sound like and you basically copy that person, you copy the way that they, they speak, the sounds they make, the rhythm of their language, that your, your, your pronunciation will change to be more like that person. If you find it difficult to speak English and would like some help to become more fluent and maybe one day speak English as well as Björk, then better speaking is for you. Björk was born in Iceland and has become a highly successful international music star. She talks about her first two albums, Debut and Post. People really liked Debut, but she knew she could do even better. So in her second album, Post, she used the same idea, a week in the life of an ordinary person, and all the good things and bad things that happen. But as she says, she feels in this album she did the songs better. When I did debut finally, after thinking about it for about 10 years, um, it, the most difficult bit was to know that it wasn't going to be perfect because I wasn't capable of doing all the things I wanted to do. But I just had to do it anyway and just take the consequences, you know, and make it be a lesson. So when everybody really, really liked debut, I was like, oh, but that's not... I can do much better than that, you know? So when I did post, for me, it's the sort of same concept... It, only I did it much better. So the ag aggressive songs are, are more aggressive, the happy songs are a lot, a lot more happier, and the delicate songs are more delicate. I've always thought of debut and post as twins, and that's why I call them de debut, which is before, and post, which is after. Sort of before and after my little lesson. And I think after this, I will move on to sort of quite sort of different things. But the, the concept with both debut and post is a week in a life of a normal person and all the ups and downs you have in one week which you can't plan. So that's why I wanted the song both on debut and post to be completely different from each other and to kind of represent that you just you can't plan your life and you're not supposed to. You're supposed to just enjoy it to the maximum and take it as it comes sort of thing. BBC Learning English dot com and with me again in the studio is teacher and teacher trainer Richard Hallows. Hello, Richard. Hello, Callum. Before we hear some advice from Richard on speaking better, let's listen again to Björk. When I did debut finally, after thinking about it for about 10 years, um, it, the most difficult bit was to know that it wasn't going to be perfect because I wasn't capable of doing all the things I wanted to do. But I just had to do it anyway and just take the consequences, you know, and make it be a lesson. So when everybody really, really liked debut, I was like, oh, but that's not... I can do much better than that, you know? So when I did post, for me, it's the sort of same concept, it, only I did it much better. So the ag aggressive songs are, are more aggressive, the happy songs are a lot, a lot more happier, and the delicate songs are more delicate. I've always thought of debut and post as twins, and that's why I call them de debut, which is before, and post, which is after. Sort of before and after my little lesson. And I think after this, I will move on to sort of quite sort of different things. But the, the concept with both debut and post is a week in a life of a normal person and all the ups and downs you have in one week, which you can't plan. So that's why I wanted the song both on debut and post to be completely different from each other and to kind of represent that you just you can't plan your life and you're not supposed to. You're supposed to just enjoy it to the maximum and take it as it comes sort of thing. So that was Björk, a very successful international pop star. But is she successful in international English, Richard? I think she is. I think she uh, speaks very well. Um, I think we can see that Björk has lived in England. 
Um, I think this shows itself in two ways. Uh, one, when we look at her vocabulary and also her pronunciation. So what is it about her vocabulary that uh, sounds so natural to you? Well, I think um, it's the way she um, collocates her words very well. Uh, collocates? What do you mean by that? Well, the way the words she uses, they go together very naturally. We use them together in a pair or, or a chunk of, of language. Can you give us uh, some examples of that? Uh, yeah, she, um, she talks about before and after and um, the ups and downs goes together, very, very strong chunk. Or um, take it as it comes. Uh, I think it, it was life, take life as it comes, take it as it comes. Very nice um, expression there. The concept with both debut and post is a week in a life of a normal person and all the ups and downs you have in one week, which you can't plan. So that's why I wanted the song both on debut and post to be completely different from each other and to kind of represent that you just you can't plan your life and you're not supposed to you're supposed to just enjoy it to the maximum and take it as it comes sort of thing and those are what what you call chunks could you tell us a little bit more about um, chunks so basically when, when we're speaking we don't speak word by word by word by word we, we put these words together so maybe you've got you know two three four words in a chunk of language and then we put these chunks together so it helps us speak much more quickly, much more fluently, and it's also easier to remember um, a chunk of language rather than individual words. So speech is made up of, of chunks rather than words, and a chunk is made up of a group of words that sound natural together. Mm, Bjork does this very well when she's speaking. What's the best way to go about learning these chunks of language? OK, well, first of all, you need to be aware that chunks exist. OK, when, when you know that, um, I think... When you're listening, when you're reading, you look for chunks of language. If you're looking, something in, looking up something in your dictionary, um, don't just look for the individual word, but look at the words that go with it. So if I look up in a dictionary the word advice, I find that word and I find the words that go with it, a piece of advice. Now that's my chunk of language. So when I record that in my vocabulary book, I write a piece of advice. It's those four words together that make up the chunk of language. And it's easier to remember uh, chunks of language than individual words. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. It's quicker and it's more natural. Mm. Now, you also mentioned uh, Björk's pronunciation. What pronunciation features uh, would you like to highlight? She's got some very interesting pronunciation features, some very native-like features, which, again, I think, you know, this show is that Björk has lived in, in England. Um, the way she says better, she, she doesn't say the T, she says better. And uh, when she says bit, she doesn't say the T. She says bit. Um, it, the most difficult bit was to know that it wasn't going to be perfect. So when I did post, for me, it's the sort of same concept, it, only I did it much better. Yes, and I think uh, I also heard her say little uh, instead of little. I think you did. I've always thought of debut and post as twins, and that's why I call them the debut, which is before, and post, which is after. Sort of before and after my little lesson. And I think after this, I will move on to sort of quite sort of different things. Some people might say that this is not a very good way of speaking. And in fact, people want to speak like the BBC or in a very formal kind of business, business-like way. But in fact, I think uh, Bjork, you know, she's a pop star. She speaks as somebody in a very informal way, in a very young kind of way of speaking. And I think it's for our listeners to decide what kind of person they want to sound like. So it's perhaps not uh, regarded by everybody as being correct uh, pronunciation, but it is a very common feature, certainly in, in particular areas of, of England. Mm, you'll find people saying better and little, uh, very much in London and around London. It's very, very widespread around here. And particularly amongst uh, young people. Yeah, yeah. So for people who who might want to, to choose to sound like a, a more native speaker, um, what advice can you give them? OK, there's a very interesting theory where if you choose one person that you want to sound like and you basically copy that person, you copy the way that they, they speak, the sounds they make, the rhythm of their language, that your, your, your pronunciation will change to be more like that person. 
So where can people find examples of native speakers which they might want to, to copy? Well, obviously, if you're not in an English-speaking country, you always have the option of the radio. Um, lots of English-speaking radio, including, of course, the BBC. Um, and just try to get as much exposure as possible uh, to listening. Choose one person that you enjoy listening to and that you would like to sound like. People might even want to sound like yourself, Callum. Or even you, Richard. <laughs> indeed, you never know. For today, Richard Hallows, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And now just time to hear today's better speaking tips again. Learn new vocabulary in groups of words or chunks, not as individual words. If you do this, then when you're speaking, you don't have to think of what you want to say word by word. You can speak in phrases and be much more fluent. Listen to English speaking on radio or television so that you hear as much good English as possible. This will improve your pronunciation as well as your general knowledge of English. Try to get as much exposure as possible uh, to listening. If you want to really improve your pronunciation, listen to the spoken English of one particular speaker who you want to sound like and try to copy the way they talk. You could choose a favourite radio or television presenter as your model. Choose one person that you enjoy listening to and that you would like to sound like. I used to play like when I was, I don't know, like 10 or 11, I used to play against the wall and I was playing against her. <laughs> you know, I don't have anything to lose, I just have to try to play loose and see what happens out there. Former Wimbledon winner Conchita Martinez using English to talk about childhood dreams of becoming a tennis champion. And also in the programme, Richard Hallows will be with me again to look at what makes Conchita such an effective user of English as an international language. Richard will also be giving us some more advice on becoming better speakers. Conchita Martinez is from Spain, but when she became an international tennis star, she needed to speak English. In this clip, she remembers how, as a young girl, she practiced tennis by hitting a ball up against a wall, and she imagined she was playing against famous tennis stars, players like Martina Navratilova. In 1994, her dream came true, and she faced her childhood heroine Martina Navratilova at Wimbledon in the women's final. Conchita spoke to the international press before the match. I used to play like when I was, I don't know, like... 10 or 11, I used to play against the wall and I was playing against her. <laughs> you know, I don't have anything to lose. I just have to try to play loose and see what happens out there. Conchita speaks English very well. But what's she doing that makes her such a good communicator in English? What's her secret to better speaking? BBC Learning English dot com. And with me again in the studio is teacher and teacher trainer Richard Hallows. Hello, Richard. Hello, Callum. Before we hear some advice from Richard, let's listen again to Conchita Martinez. I used to play like when I was, I don't know, like 10 or 11. I used to play against the wall and I was playing against her. <laughs> you know, I don't have anything to lose. I just have to try to play loose and see what happens out there. So not a very clear recording uh, there, Richard. I apologise for that. But is she a clear speaker? I think Conchita, I mean, obviously she speaks quite well, but I think she sounds better because she has certain kind of tricks that she uses. Tricks? What do you mean by that? She uses lots of fillers and uh, hesitation devices. F well, for example, when she's speaking, she says like quite a lot and um, er quite a lot and you know now, these words don't have any meaning in themselves, but they're very useful to make yourself sound more fluent um, and confident. So um, if you're speaking and um, you want to give the um, impression that, that you're fluent, you use the, these things like uh, and um and, and that kind of thing. 
obviously you're exaggerating, you're making that, you're, you're using this quite a lot. If you use these fillers, hesitation devices too much, it can actually sound quite irritating. Right. So they are good things to use to make you sound natural, but don't overdo it. Not too much. I used to play like when I was, I don't know, like 10 or 11, I used to play against the wall and I was playing against her. <laughs> Um, I think there are some particular places we might think about where you could incorporate, where you could use this this er sound and think about the the extra sound that it makes. Let me let me give you an example. Mm. Maybe that's not very clear. If I'm giving my opinion, for example, I might use um, the expression "I think." Now, to give myself some time to think about my opinion, I could say "I think," uh, and there's a very strong cur sound there. Mm -hmm. Make yourself sound very natural. All right. So, so you're sort of linking the, the words and the ideas together, and that sounds natural as it's mm. giving yourself thinking time. If I were giving you some advice, maybe I could say, if I were you, I'd... Uh, and we have that der sound. Mm -hmm. Very, very natural, very confident sounding. And th this sound itself, uh, is, is, is common in, in many parts of English, isn't it? It's common in, in many languages, in fact, but not all languages. But yes, in English, and we, we use it a lot. Um, so Conchita's talking about, I had to practice, you know, it was difficult, you know. And this, you know, it doesn't mean anything, but it just makes her sound, again, more confident, more fluent. And again, that uh sound mm, uh, in mm. there. What are other examples of, of where we use this uh sound? OK, the uh sound is um, not the er, uh, but the uh is the most common sound in English. Uh, we use it all the time. If there's one one sound which um, people should learn when they're speaking English, it's, it's, it's this uh sound. For example, she says, and I was like playing her. So instead of saying and, she says un. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying was, she says was. And instead of saying her, she says her. Now, is that lazy speech? Some people might say that's not speaking properly. Uh, no, not at all. It's the correct way to speak. If you don't use the uh sound, you're going to find your speech much slower. It's going to be more difficult because you have to pronounce every word very correctly, using your mouth, uh, moving your mouth a lot. It's how we speak in English. So it's a very weak sound which helps you be more, more, more fluent when you're speaking. Mm. Um, it, it helps often if you think about when you learn some a grammar um, structure, for example. Think about when you compare two things and we say taller than, but when we're speaking very quickly we say taller than. Mm. So I, I think, for example, Co uh, Callum, I'm, I'm one metre seventy and how tall are you? Um, I've no idea in the metric. I know I'm five foot, uh, five foot eight and a half. So. Okay, so I think you're about one seven five or or something. Oh, I see. So, so um, you're taller than I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm taller than you. Okay, taller than, taller than. It's it's uh, it's not taller than. It's taller than. Yeah. Look how difficult it is to say taller than mm -hmm. when compared to taller than, and it's what people really say. That's the important point. So apart from this weak sound, this uh sound. Any other particular pronunciation points you, uh, you would like to draw our attention to? Yeah, Conchita loses the T on the end of some of her words, uh, which, again, is, is the correct thing to do in, in certain situations. Uh, she says, um, see what happens out there, not see what happens out there, which is much more difficult to say. So, again, by losing certain sounds, she makes her speech more fluent. You know, I don't have anything to lose. I just have to try to play loose and see what happens out there. So, thank you very much once again, Richard Hallows. Thanks, Callum. BBC Learning English dot com. Sometimes we use noises rather than words to hesitate. Such hesitation varies from one language to another. This is what they do in Somali. In, in, or en, en is what our people use, so even if they speak in, in different languages. So in or en is the best word for us to feel the hesitations. <laughs> As we said, in English we use the sound hmm or er. Uh. But as Richard warned me, if we overuse these sounds, we can sound the very opposite of fluent. So what else can we say to give ourselves time to think when we're speaking? 
Listen to this conversation. A man is asked a question about Shakespeare and his plays. He needs a bit of time to think of the answer. What phrases does he use to give himself that time to think? Are you interested in Shakespeare? Uh, yeah.、Um, yeah, I suppose I'm sort of interested.、Um, no, you know he's a great playwright.、Um, yeah, yeah, I suppose I. No, I, I am. I, I am interested. That man sounded like he needed time to think, and he used certain phrases to give himself time. He certainly uses er.、Uh, he also used the phrase you know. Another very common spoken English expression used by that man was sort of. Listen again. Are you interested in Shakespeare? Uh, yeah.、Um, yeah, I suppose I'm sort of interested. Um, no, you know he's a great. Playwright.、Um, yeah, yeah. I suppose I. No, I, I am. I, I am interested. Now here's another useful tip for giving yourself time when speaking English. If you're asked a question, then you can just repeat it before you answer it. This man does something similar. He's asked a rather tricky question about men's clothes. What does it mean when a man wears a suit? Listen to how he answers this. And ultimately, what do you think the suit represents? <laughs> oh dear! In your terms, how do you think it defines a person?、Um, I think that the suit can、um, take away.、Um, it's a very good question. What does a suit define? I don't know. That's another very good way to answer a difficult question or to give yourself time to think. The man said, "Hmm." That's a very good question, and then he repeated the question. Let's hear it again. And ultimately, what do you think the suit represents? <laughs> oh dear! In your terms, how do you think it defines a person?、Um, I think that the suit can、um, take away.、Um, it's a very good question. What does the suit define? I don't know. Now, before we go today, if you didn't quite catch all of Richard's better speaking tips, don't worry. Here's a chance to hear them again. You'll sound more natural and fluent when speaking English if you use hesitation devices and phrases which give you time to think. Noises like "mmm," phrases like "you know," and sort of. When she's speaking, she says "like" quite a lot, and.、Um, Er,、uh, quite a lot, and you know. Now these words don't have any meaning in themselves, but they're very useful to make yourself sound more fluent、um, and confident. Use the hesitation noise、uh, with set phrases like "If I were you, I'd."、Um... If you're asked a question, you can give yourself time to think by repeating the question or saying, "That's a good question." In your terms, how do you think it defines a person?、Um, I think that the suit can、um, take away.、Um, it's a very good question. What does the suit define? I don't know. Certainly, I mean, it was a very great battle between me and Damon in、uh, in the stage of the race. Tough race, I have to say, and he has done a really good job during that race. We both haven't done、uh, mistakes, and it was really,、uh, really, I would say, thrilling for you at the outside. That was former Formula One driver Michael Schumacher using English to talk clearly and confidently about his sport, motor racing. If you find it difficult to speak English and would like some help to become more fluent, and maybe one day use English as confidently as a world-famous racing driver, then better speaking is for you. Michael Schumacher's first language is German. He was born near Cologne in what was then West Germany in 1969. 
and started driving go karts when he was only four years old. He later took up motor racing and, in 1994, won the first of his World Formula One championships. In the world of Formula One, English is the language that drivers from different countries often use to communicate with each other and with the world's media. Now here's Michael Schumacher talking to journalists about a race he's just won against his rival, the British driver Damon Hill. Michael is pleased to be the winner, but he's also apologising for something. Certainly, I mean it was a very great battle between me and Damon in、uh, in the stage of the race. Tough race, I have to say, and he has done really a good job during that race. We both haven't done、uh, mistakes, and it was really,、uh, really, I would say, thrilling for you at the outside. I, I have to say, that I did make some comments this year that about about Damon that I didn't have that kind of respect that I maybe had about somebody else, but I have to admit that I was wrong because what he has done. In the last two races, in particular, and he must have done even before, has been a proper and fantastic job, and he has, and he has been a great rival. And、uh, I, mu- I must say sorry for for what I maybe、uh, said, but I'd like to congratulate him for all his、uh, good jobs he has done so far. Michael Schumacher, very pleased to be a winner, but also apologising for criticising his rival, Damon Hill. I must say sorry for what I may be said," he says. BBCLearningEnglish.com, and with me again in the studio is teacher and teacher trainer Richard Hallows. Hello, Richard. Hello, Callum. But before we hear anything more from Richard, let's listen to Michael Schumacher again. Certainly, I mean it was a very great battle between me and Damon in、uh, in the stage of the race. Tough race, I have to say, and he has done really a good job during that race. We both haven't done、uh, mistakes, and it was really,、uh, really, I would say, thrilling for you at the outside. I, I have to say, that I did make some comments this year that about about Damon that I didn't have that kind of respect that I maybe had about somebody else, but I have to admit that I was wrong because what he has done. In the last two races, in particular, and he must have done even before, has been a proper and fantastic job, and he has, he has been a great rival. And、uh, I must say sorry for for what I maybe、uh, said, but I'd like to congratulate him for all his、uh, good jobs he has done so far. Richard, how successful do you think he is as a speaker of international English? I think he's a very successful user. He communicates very clearly.、Uh, we can follow what he's saying with, with no problem at all. If there's anything that that perhaps is interesting about the way he speaks, that maybe we could learn lessons from, is、um, the way he contracts his grammar. And what do you mean by that? I'm talking particularly about the way he uses the present perfect.、Mm. For example, he has been or he has done. Tough race, I have to say, and he has done a really good job during that race. Really, I would say, thrilling for you at the outside. This is exactly the way that that、um, he uses it, rather than he's been or he's done. Now, native speakers would would tend to use the contracted form.、Uh, he's he's been, he's done. But is it is it wrong to use the full form? It's not wrong. I mean, you, you know, the, the meaning is still there. I'm just thinking how to make it easier for the speaker to speak more fluently. And I, I suppose it's it's also、um, easier for the listener、uh, as well because it, it helps to preserve the the sort of rhythm and pattern of English.、Mm, yeah, that, that's a, a very good point. So, in all of his speech, is there this pattern of not using contractions when a native speaker would normally use contractions? Well, in fact, no. There are there are cases where he speaks with very good contractions. I didn't have. That kind of respect that I maybe had about somebody else, and it does make his speaking, you know, more fluent. More, it's easier to speak. But it's particularly interesting that it's the present perfect where he always makes this mistake. Right, and、uh, it's interesting what you're saying about, about should have and, and should have, because the pronunciation of of have changes quite considerably there.、Mm, it's this weak form in English, this a、uh, sound、mm-hmm. which which we use all the time.、Uh, for example, my name, it's not Richard. Uh, it's Richard.、Mm-hmm. Uh, your name. It's not Callum. It's Callum. Callum. Yeah, we use this all the time. So should have is an example of, of this when it just makes your speech, you know, more fluent.
Are there other examples of this contraction which are useful for students to be able to, to, to hear, to recognise, and to be able to, to, say, produce themselves? I think there's one, one particular... I mean, there are lots of examples. One particular one stands out in my mind, and this is thinking about conditionals, particularly maybe um, a third conditional, which is... It's very complicated grammatically to produce, and sometimes grammar structures like this are easier if you learn them phonologically, i.e. by sound. Can you give us an example? Of this? Well, if I break it down slowly, for example, if I had had more time, for example, I would have taken the bus. So it's a very long, complicated structure. So if I had had more time, I would have taken the bus. And mm. how, how do we contract that? We'd say, if I'd had more time, I'd have taken the bus. Right, so if I'd had more time I'd have taken the bus. Mm. So we sort of lose, we, like you say, we squash down those words. They're still there but they're very contracted, very small. Mm. I think it's, you know, it makes learning grammar, remembering grammar rather uh, the structure, much easier. Let's have a look at uh, um, uh, another point. Um, wh what about his generally his pronunciation, for example, his intonation, how his voice goes up and down? Yeah, the, the, he, although I find him quite easy to understand, I find myself sometimes um, switching off a little bit, not not being very interested in what he has to say. And, uh, and why is that? Because you know, it's an interesting subject. Perhaps. It is an interesting subject. It's all to do with the pattern of his voice, the intonation, the rise and fall. Of and, his voice. And, and w what is it about his intonation that uh, like, it makes you switch off? OK, well, in, in German, their intonation is quite flat. It's, it's quite different from English. And so, as an English speaker, I hear it as being a little bit boring. Right, so, so if, if native speakers used that same intonation pattern, they would come across uh, as, as boring. And this is perhaps something that's difficult for speakers of other languages with different intonation patterns, mm. difficult for them to get right. So how can we help the students with this? Well, it's a case of exaggerating your intonation, making it bigger, or recognising which intonation pattern goes with which attitude. Attitude? Well, for example, you can guess what mood I'm in, how I'm feeling. By the way, I, I say a word. I can say the same word. Well, let, let's try. See if mm. you can work out how I'm feeling. So, for example, if I say, Callum, how, well, how do I feel? Well, um, uh, excited, pleased to see me. Amazingly, yes. Or um, <laughs> perhaps, Callum. Oh, well, there you're, you're, you're disappointed if I've done something that uh, you disapprove of. Perhaps, mm. And yeah. what, what's the difference in my intonation there? Well, it's, it, it's, it's the way your voice goes up and down and how you... Which one has a, has a kind of a bigger rise and fall? Is it, is it the happy one or the not so happy Well, the one, one where you're, you're pleased to see me uh, okay. ha seems to have a, a, a larger, larger rise. And in that, it. that's generally a pattern, that we have larger intonation rises for very positive mm -hmm. attitudes and smaller ones for very negative ones. So this is why I hear my has been a little bit boring, perhaps, because it's quite a narrow intonation uh -huh. range. Uh, any other points connected to intonation? We also use intonation to take turns in a conversation. Mm -hmm. So I use my intonation to tell you that I've finished speaking. And so therefore the person you're speaking to knows that now it's their turn to speak, their turn uh, in the conversation. Yeah, and I do that by my intonation going down. Right, so when you go down, you know that it's, it's, it's the end of the conversation yeah. or the end of my part of the conversation. See, see if you can guess which is the final thing on my list of shopping here. OK. OK. So I went, I went to the supermarket and I bought milk, bread, cheese, eggs. Well, I would say uh, eggs. I think well, I you say anymore, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you get the idea. Yes, yeah, so, so a downward turn in the intonation can indicate that that's the, that's the, the end of, in that example, a list but also the, the end, and now it's time for someone else to speak. Yeah, so we can see how intonation is really important, A for attitude and B for turn-taking. Right. So to summarise then, what's your general advice for, for people who might have these particular pronunciation problems? Well, thinking about um, contracting grammar, I think it's a good idea if you have access to a tape and a course book to maybe listen to the tape scripts again, read... Uh, listen to the tapes, read the tape scripts in the back of the book and listen for specifically for any contractions of grammar that occur. And I think you'll be surprised how many there are. When you're thinking about your grammar, always try and reduce it to the minimum so that there's the, um, the shortest possible sounds, grammar sounds in there. Like our example, if I'd had more time, I'd have... Yeah? 
thinking about intonation, I think, again, if you've got access to tape scripts, listen again and listen to people's intonation. Think about what attitude is the person trying to convey. Think about when people take turns when they're speaking, how does the intonation change? Huh? And um, when you're speaking, try and be interesting by increasing the range of your intonation. Thank you very much, Richard. That was very interesting. It's my pleasure. Now, if you didn't quite catch all of Richard's better speaking tips, don't worry. Here's a chance to hear them again. Richard's first piece of advice is if you want to sound more fluent and natural in English, don't forget to make contractions. Instead of saying, he has done, for example, say, he's done. And listen for specifically for any contractions of grammar that occur, and I think you'll be surprised how many there are. Richard also warns learners of English to be particularly careful with contractions in long, complicated sentences, like conditionals. We'd say, if I'd had more time, I'd have taken the bus. And be careful with intonation. Make sure your English doesn't sound boring because your intonation is too flat. Listen to people's intonation. Think about what attitude is the person trying to convey. Think about when people take turns when they're speaking, how does the intonation change? The issue that my parents had with me and my choice of profession was that they thought it was beneath me. They thought that I should have, I had a higher calling, that I should have gone into politics. And they were just purely, simply disappointed in me. Somali-born fashion model Iman talking there about the reaction of her parents to her chosen career. In today's Better Speaking, we hear more from Iman and, as usual, teacher and trainer Richard Hallows will be with me to explain what makes her such an effective user of English as an international language. Richard will also be giving us some more advice on becoming better speakers of English. I mean, I think it's a problem. Students are always, always coming to me saying, you know, I need more words, I need more vocabulary, and it, it is a problem. Uh, but I think it's a case of organising yourself and, and having a, a strategy which helps you learn more words more quickly. If you find it difficult to speak English and would like some help and advice on how to become more fluent and maybe one day use English as confidently as Iman, then Better Speaking is for you. Iman was born in the East African country of Somalia. While she was a student, her distinctive good looks were noticed by an American photographer who asked her if he could take her picture. At first, she said no, but eventually she agreed, and when she arrived in the United States in the 1970s, she was an immediate success in the world of fashion modelling. In this interview, we hear her talk about her family's reaction to her becoming a model, particularly as Somalia is a Muslim country, and many of its people are very traditional. Did her chosen career not lead to problems with her family, for example? Was she, as a Muslim woman, not supposed to be very modest and wear a scarf or veil to cover her face? For one thing, let me make it very clear. Somalia is a, is a Muslim country, 100% Muslim country. But we also have, an, we have a, a very strong cultural identity. Uh, Somali women don't wear veils. Uh, we have our own traditional clothes. We cover our head, but definitely it's not a veil. So we've never worn veils. I've never worn veils. My mother has not worn veils. So that was not the issue. The issue that my parents had with me and my choice of profession was that they thought it was beneath me. They thought that I should have... I had a higher calling, that I should have gone into politics. And they were just purely, simply disappointed in me. So it was just the choice of profession that I chose that they were not happy with. Iman explained that even though Somalia is a Muslim country, it has its own distinctive culture and traditions. While Somali women wear a scarf to cover their heads, they don't wear anything which covers the face. They don't wear veils. So it wasn't the thing she wore as a model that made her parents unhappy. It was the fact that they thought modelling was not a good enough job for their daughter. It was beneath her. 
They wanted her to have a professional job. In fact, they wanted her to become a politician. The issue that my parents had with me and my choice of profession was that they thought it was beneath me. They thought that I should have I had a higher calling, that I should have gone into politics, and they were just purely, simply disappointed in me. But despite her parents' disappointment in her choice of career, Iman went on to become a very successful and famous fashion model, first in the United States and then all around the world. So, coming from a traditional African Muslim country, what does Iman herself think of the modelling business? It's a very provoking business. It's all sexual business in terms of how the girls are photographed. They're supposed to be wanton and sexy and, and voluptuous and all that. And it was not something that went hand in hand with my up- upbringing as a Muslim girl. So there was that conflict, and I think my com- that conflict stays with me in a, in a daily basis. And this choice of profession that I have chosen. Iman says that modeling, particularly when being photographed, is all about the model making herself and her body look sexually attractive. She still feels a conflict between her upbringing as a Muslim girl and this aspect of her career. It's a very provoking business. It's all sexual business in terms of how the girls are photographed. They're supposed to be wanton and sexy and, and voluptuous and all that. And it was not something that went hand in hand with my up- upbringing as a Muslim girl. So there was that conflict, and I think my com- that conflict stays with me in a, in a daily basis. And this choice of profession that I have chosen. BBC Learning English dot com. And with me again in the studio is teacher and teacher trainer Richard Hallows. Hello, Richard. Hello, Callum. Richard, Iman has been a very successful international model, but is she a successful user of international English? I think she's extremely successful. I think、uh, what makes her particularly、uh, good is she's got a very wide range of vocabulary. And why is having a wide range of vocabulary, you know, good? Well. It, She uses it. It makes her very interesting to listen to.、Mm. Then, can you give me an example? Yeah, she's、uh, she's describing models or what's necessary in a model, and she uses words wanton, sexy, and voluptuous. Very expressive、uh, language. Yeah, extremely descriptive. Yeah, very nice. It's a very provoking business. It's all sexual business in terms of how the girls are photographed. They're supposed to be wanton and sexy and, and voluptuous and all that. So having a wide vocabulary is is good to make yourself more descriptive and interesting as a speaker.、Um, how can students develop this? I mean, I think it's a problem. Students are always always coming to me saying, you know, I need more words, I need more vocabulary, and it, it is a problem.、Uh, but I think it's a case of organising yourself and and having a, a strategy which helps you learn more words more quickly. And、uh, what are some examples of a, a way that students can? Can learn these, these okay, words. Okay, well, if we go back to Iman and we think about these words that that hang together, this wanton, sexy, and voluptuous, I think it's it's、um, a very good way to learn vocabulary in subject areas.、Mm-hmm. There's a psychological theory that in your brain you have lots of little boxes, and in each box you have vocabulary connected to one to one subject. And so it ma- it makes sense to learn your vocabulary, to organise your vo- vocabulary in your notebook, and learn it in subject areas. So, for example, well, say, say you want to learn、um, vocabulary around, I don't know, say、uh, a school.、Mm-hmm. Maybe you want to build what we call a mind map in your notebooks. A mind map. A mind map. It, it's also called a spidergram. Basically, you've got the words and you link them together in a logical order. Any order, logical for you.、Um, so maybe you have、um, subject, the word subject, and then connected to that, you could have biology, chemistry, maths. Physics, whatever, and then next to that you could have words maybe like I don't know, love, hate. Maybe I hate physics, or I don't know. You can organise it how you want, but to make those connections in your brain、mm-hmm. to help you remember. So it's more helpful for students to organise these words by subject rather than maybe just alphabetically、mm-hmm. in a notebook. I mean, alphabetically is quite. It's a different system to then you've got a mini dictionary that you can refer、mm. to. It's a, it's another way, but I do like this idea of、uh, organising things by subject. Okay, let, let's move on to、um, a, a different area. What other things、uh, could you pick up on from、uh, Iman's English? Okay, well, something else that she does, which is I think very effective, is she repeats words and she repeats structures sometimes, but particularly. Uh, if we listen to her talking about Somali women wearing veils, she repeats the word veil quite a lot. 
Uh, Somali women don't wear veils. Uh, we have our own traditional clothes. We cover our head, but definitely it's not a veil. So we've never worn veils. I've never worn veil. My mother has not worn veil. So that was not the issue. Now, if you were to talk like this in an everyday conversation, it might sound quite strange, but maybe if, you, if you're making some kind of presentation, something like that, in business or, I don't know, in, at school, it's quite an effective communication strategy. And it's something that, that politicians uh, uh, do quite a lot, isn't mm. it? Mm. They do. They will say, my government's going to... My government's going to... Da, 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 and they repeat the same structure again and again and again. So it's almost like a, a, a kind of speech make, a kind of rhetoric. It is, it is. Uh, yeah. but, but generally not a useful thing for day-to-day conversation. I think it probably sounds a little bit strange in an everyday um, chat kind of situation. Um. What is strange about it in a, in a chat conversation? How can you avoid that? Well, you should try to um, not repeat the same word, really. But, and by having this, you know, increased range of vocabulary, it's good to change the words. OK, any other points that we can pick up on? Well, just generally, I think it's quite interesting that Imam is obviously married to an Englishman. And so she's obviously, you know, has, and she lives in America, having lots of exposure to English. So I think it makes this point again that our listeners should try to get as much exposure to English as possible. And uh, through, through what means if they're not living in an English-speaking country? Listening to the BBC World Service is quite <laughs> a good idea. Or, um, you know, obviously uh, TV, etc. Maybe try and get some kind of pen friend so mm. you have some kind of interactive dialogue going on there or even some uh, internet chat, something like that might be quite accessible for our listeners. So, Richard, I wonder... Uh, if you could give us those few pieces of advice there in summary. Okay. well, first of all, increase your vocabulary range and do this by subject area, organising words connected with some subject and make the connections, you know, in your mind, organise it in your notebook. Secondly, if you're making some kind of presentation, repeat the word or repeat the structure. Yeah, very effective. And finally, try to get as much exposure to English, either through the radio, TV, internet, as you can. For today, Richard, thank you very much. Your spoken English will be more effective and sound more interesting if you can use a wider range of vocabulary. Think about how you write down and record new words and phrases. Don't just write them down in alphabetical order. It's easier to remember new words if they can also be written down with other words, words which relate to the same topic or subject. Increase your vocabulary range and do this by subject area, organising words connected with some subject and make the connections, you know, in your mind, organise it in your notebook. If you're making a speech or giving a presentation, you can emphasise an important point or an argument by repeating certain key words or phrases. If you're making some kind of presentation, repeat the word or repeat the structure. You'll be a better, more fluent speaker of English if you can expose yourself to as much of the language as possible. Take every opportunity to listen to English and communicate with people who use the language well. Listen to the radio or watch TV or DVDs. Find a pen friend in an English-speaking country. Join a discussion group online or interact with English speakers around the world by email. And finally, try to get as much exposure to English, either through the radio, TV, internet, as you can. I think it's important for Chinese football uh, to have some foreign players uh, who can give some news about uh, tactic, I think, to, to Chinese players. Czech footballer Václav Němeček using English to talk about being one of the first European players to join a football club in China. And also in the programme, teacher and trainer Richard Hallows is with me again to look at what makes Václav such an effective user of English as an international language. And Richard will also be giving us some more advice on becoming better speakers of English. <laughs> Václav Němeček was a leading footballer in his home country. 
As a talented young player, he played for the top Czech club Sparta Prague. In his mid-twenties, he played for leading Western European clubs, first in France and then in Switzerland. In 1998, he accepted an offer to play in China for the champion club Dalian Wanda. At the time, this was quite unusual for a professional European footballer to join a club in China. In this interview, he talks about the benefits of foreign players playing in China. I think it's important for Chinese football uh, to have some foreign players uh, who can give some news about uh, tactic, I think, to, to Chinese players. You are taking football into China. China has played football in isolation for so long. Yeah, yeah, but, but now I, I feel that China uh, starts to open, to, to open for everything, for economy, uh, f uh, for sport. Uh, I, I think it's, it's uh, the country who, who is in developing time now. Václav can communicate well in English, but what is it that makes him a good communicator? What's his secret to better speaking? bbclearningenglish.com And with me again in the studio is teacher and teacher trainer Richard Hallows. Hello, Richard. Hello, Callum. Um, Václav Nemeček, an international footballer, Richard, but is his use of international English as successful as his football? I think he's a... a it's quite an interesting case here. His English level is not terribly high, but the way he uses his English, you know, he sounds very confident and he sounds, you know, he's a good communicator. Hmm. Now, I think, I think one thing which makes him sound a better speaker than he actually is, is the way he says, I feel and I think. So when he's giving his opinion, he sounds, you know, like he's very sure what he wants to say. I think it's important for Chinese football uh, to have some foreign players uh, who can give some news about uh, tactic, I think, to, to Chinese players. But you are taking football into China. China has played football in isolation for so long. Yeah, yeah, but, but now I, I feel that China uh, starts to open, to, to open for everything. For so I feel this, I, I, I think that. Are there other, other ways that uh, we can express this? Mm, I mean, I think most learners of English learn I think or I believe as mm -hmm. um, starting points of giving your opinion. And that's very good. And we use that all the time. But maybe our listeners could um, learn some more ways, develop this a little bit and sound even more confident. OK, well, um, you have the platform. Well, let's, well, let's have some examples. Well, for example, I think is a very, is a very neutral way of, mm -hmm. of giving your opinion. And I think I believe is a slightly more formal way. Mm -hmm. But maybe um, a very informal way is to say, I reckon. I reckon. Mm. Right. So could, uh, how would you use that, for example? Um, I, I reckon it's going to rain later. OK, so you could say, I think it's going to rain, um, but I believe it's going to rain would, would sound a little bit formal, a little bit... Yeah, right, so that's yeah. as you said before. Mm. What about if you feel very strongly about something? Well, if you have a strong conviction about something, you might say something like, I strongly believe that. Mm -hmm. And that quite formal? It's quite formal, yeah, very strong as well. Mm -hmm. um, or I'm absolutely certain that. Right, and that's very strong. Mm. Oh, you could, maybe if you, if you don't have a very strong conviction about something the opposite, you might say, mm, I'm not so sure, but... Okay, so, so different ways of getting into the uh, uh, con conversation. Mm. So develop a range of um, ways of expressing your opinion, from you know, being very sure to not sure, being very formal to very informal. Okay, well, let's briefly go over those again. So ways of expressing your opinion. We've got I think, mm -hmm. I reckon, I believe. They're three very good ones to, to start off with. Strong opinion. Very strong opinion. I strongly believe that. Mm -hmm. Or, I'm absolutely certain that. What about if you're not so sure how you feel? Well, I'm not so sure, but... Da, 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 da. What else would you like to pick out from that uh, speech? OK, well, as well as giving his opinion, Václav also responds to a question, and he responds with, yeah, which is not a very good way of, of responding, in fact. I mean, it's OK, it's OK, we understand. But probably better would be something like, that's true, but... Yeah, or, that's true, and, depending if he wants to, you know, contrast the point or not. But you are taking football into China. China has played football in isolation for so long. Yeah, 
Yeah, but but now I, I feel that China uh, starts to open. So, are there more ways of responding? Well, yeah, you could also say exactly. If I, you know, I absolutely agree with you, or if I don't really agree, I could say, well, I agree up to a point, but, yeah,、mm -hmm. and maybe if I disagree, I could say I disagree, but it's not very natural. Better,、mm, oh, come on. Right, which is a, a very natural, That's very, very natural, natural yeah, expression, much, much more yes, natural. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell you what, Callum, let's let's have a little practice now and see if we can use, see how many of these different ways of giving opinion and responding we we can use now. Okay.、Uh, okay. I'm going to give you some very controversial statements. Okay? okay. Right. I want you to respond. Right. Think about what we just talked about using a range, etc.、Uh -huh. etc. Et so, for example, I reckon a woman's place is in the home. Oh, I'm absolutely certain that、uh, many people would disagree with that. Okay,、mm -hmm. maybe a oh come on, <laughs> something like that might be quite.、Um, or how about I believe football only creates violence. I agree up to a point.、Uh, I, I think football can bring a lot of things. Violence is perhaps one of the negative things it can bring. So I agree up to a point. Okay,、uh, let's let's do one final one. How about、um, not everyone would agree with me, but. I think men should be paid more than women. Oh come on! Don't be stupid. Yeah, very good. <laughs> okay, so there's, there's a whole range of ways of giving opinion and responding. Okay, I reckon we've、uh, done enough of that、oh. for for now. So、uh, let, let's go back to to Vatslav's、uh, English.、Uh, any other points? Yeah, I think、um, I made the point that I think Vatslav's level of English is not terribly high, but in fact he is a very strong communicator. So he's using the little English he has in a very effective way. For example, well, for example, he says、uh, we give some news about tactics,、uh, which is not a very good structure. I think it should be give some advice or something like that. But I understand what he wants. What he wants to say. I think it's important for Chinese football、uh, to have some foreign players、uh, who can give some news about、uh, tactic. I think to to Chinese players. Another example, he says,、um, China is a country who is in developing time.、Uh, I think it's、uh, the country who who is in developing time now. I understand what he wants to say. I think it should be、um, a country which is developing at the moment, or something like that. But I understand that's the point. So he's a very strong communicator, and I think this is a good tip for our listeners: to don't be afraid of making mistakes. Use the English you have, and just try and communicate. It's the way to learn and improve. So, if you could summarise those points for us, please, Richard. Well, I think the first thing is. Develop a range of ways of giving your opinion and responding to people's opinion. I think, I reckon, in my opinion, etc. Think about how you can use your vocabulary and your grammar. It doesn't matter how much or how little you have, as effectively as possible. Think about number one, communicating, and number two, communicating. Richard Hallows for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. BBC Learning English dot com. I was talking there with Richard about ways of giving opinions. Do you use the wide range of expressions that Richard suggested? We asked some learners to respond to the same statement that Richard put to me: that women should be paid less than men. No, I completely disagree with this because women has women have、uh, a lot of things to spend on. No, <laughs> definitely not. No, I think they work harder. Especially moms, sometimes they have to combine work at home and work in the office. I think they should be paid more. No, absolutely not. Everybody is equal. Not surprisingly, perhaps some strong opinions from three female learners of English from Afghanistan, Nigeria, and China. They certainly know the language of strong disagreement. Now, before we go today, if you didn't quite catch all of Richard's better speaking tips, don't worry. Here's a chance to hear them again. Using different ways to give your opinion can make you sound more confident and fluent. Begin by using phrases like "I think" or "I believe." If you use these already, then use other common English phrases to express opinions like "I reckon." We've got. I think,、mm -hmm. I reckon, I believe. No, three very good ones to to start off with.
When you're having a discussion with somebody and you want to respond to the person's opinion, don't just say yes or no. Use different ways of responding. For example, if you agree, you can say exactly. Or if you partly agree but partly disagree, you can say that's true, but. Or you could say, well, I agree up to a point, but. And if you strongly disagree and are speaking informally, you can say, oh come on. You could also say exactly. If I, you know, I absolutely agree with you, or if I don't really agree, I could say, well, I agree up to a point, but. No, absolutely not. Everybody is equal. If you want to become a better speaker, you need to practice and use the words you know as best you can. Remember what we've said before in this series: the important thing is to try and communicate. Think about how you can use your vocabulary and your grammar. It doesn't matter how much or how little you have, as effectively as possible. Think about number one, communicating, and number two, communicating. BBCLearning English dot com presents. Talk about English, a series of radio features that support your English language studies. This week we continue our series, Better Speaking, presented by Callum Robertson and featuring interviews with Richard Hallows. Let's start at the beginning. Abba, in fact, is the first letter of the Christian names of Anna, Fried, Benny, Bjorn, and Agnita. That makes Abba. Yeah, right. But it started all, Benny, with the Hepsters, right? For me, it did. Yes. Oh, well, it started much earlier than that because my grandfather gave me an accordion when I was six years old. That's how I came into music. He played himself, and so did my father. Swedish superstars ABBA, who took their name from the first letters of the names of the four members of the group: Agneta, Benny, Bjorn, and Annafrid. In today's Better Speaking, we hear more from ABBA, and as usual, English teacher Richard Hallows will be with me to explain what makes the four members of ABBA such effective users of English as an international language. Richard will also be giving us some more advice on becoming better speakers of English. I think it's very useful to employ some of this vague language when you're speaking words like ish or sort of or kind of. It's very useful, and it can make you sound more interesting, more more natural kind of speaker. If you find it difficult to speak English and would like some help and advice on how to become more fluent and maybe one day use English as confidently as Abba, then better speaking is for you. <laughs> Abba were one of the most popular groups in many countries around the world throughout the 70s and early 1980s. We hear today an interview with the four members of Abba: Agneta, Bjorn, Benny, and Anna Frida. Or Frida, as she was also called, at the height of their fame, the interviewer wanted to know why they spoke such good English. Does English have that much effect on your life? We have so many English television programs,、yeah. American, and we don't dub them; we subtitle them. So we read the Swedish words and listen to the English language、mm-hmm. all the time.、And、Same thing with films, you know, and and they play records on the radio. They most of them are、uh, English and American. In Sweden, people learn English at school, and Swedes also watch a lot of English language television and films. The Swedish translation is not dubbed, not spoken over the English, but appears as subtitles or writing at the bottom of the TV or cinema screen. So the audience can hear the English words as well as reading the Swedish translation. And there's lots of pop music too, in English, of course. So young people growing up in Sweden get to hear a lot of English. We have so many English. Television programs,、yeah. American, and we don't dub them; we subtitle them. So we read the Swedish words and listen to the English language、mm-hmm. all the time.、And、Same thing with films, you know, and and they play records on the radio. There, most of them are、uh, English and American. Abba weren't always called Abba. The group's original name was the Hepstars. They were very successful in their home country of Sweden, selling more records than the Beatles at that time. The Hepstars, though, became Abba, but where does that name come from? Let's start at the beginning. Abba, in fact, 
is the first letter of the Christian names of Anafrid, Beni, Bjorn and Agnita. That makes Abba. Yeah, right. But it started all, Beni, with the Hepstars, right? For me it did, yes. Oh, well, it you. started much earlier than that because my grandfather gave me an accordion when I was six years old. That's how I came into music. He played himself and so did my father. Well, tell us about the Hepstars. This was, what, 1962, the Hepstars? Yes, that's when we started. And uh, that was about the same time when the Beatles became so popular all over the world. And we were very well off. We sold like eight or nine golden records in Sweden. I think we outsold the Beatles by numbers, not by music. Benny, then how did you meet Bjorn? Well, we met on the road, actually. I was in, in the Hepstars and he was playing in a folk group. The Hoot Nanny Singers. The Hoot Nanny Singers, yes. Mm. BBCLearningEnglish.com Richard, ABBA, very successful international singing stars, but are they international speaking stars? Very much so. I think ABBA speak very fluently with great range of vocabulary, amazing speakers, really. What I'd particularly like to talk about today is the way they use vague language. And what do you mean by vague language? Well, when you, when you don't want to say something exactly, um, we use it also just for adding colour to your conversation, make yourself sound more interesting. Some examples I'd like to point out are when Benny says, it was about the same time, or we sold like eight or nine golden records. It was about the same time when the Beatles became so popular all over the world. And we were very well off. We sold like eight or nine golden records in Sweden. I think we outsold the Beatles by numbers, not by music. So it's not being exact, it's not being specific, it's, it's um, sort of being vague. Exactly, sort of is, is another way of being vague. So we've got the examples there. It was uh, about the same time uh, we sold like eight or nine, so like and about. What other expressions can we use to, to add this vagueness colour into our language? OK, well, Callum, kind of, why don't you um, tell people what, colour my shirt is today ah okay um well it's it's kind of it's sort of red mm. it's um it's not exactly red i suppose it's um could you say reddish reddish, reddish. it's reddish. kind of it's kind of red and it's brown isn't it maybe mm, we a, could say so it's, it's a reddish brown reddish brown okay um and also i think i said it's sort of it's red. sort of also kind of you also say yeah, yes. so sort of kind of red Reddish. This mm. issue is very interesting, actually. Mm. Uh, we can use it in, in loads of different ways. And such as? Well, um, ask me what time it is. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> what time is it, Richard? Well, I'm not wearing my watch, but I think it's tennis. Tennis. Uh, so you can add this on to, to, to any words? Uh, yeah, like I could say oldish or earlyish, or in fact, we can use ish on its own, just as a word in its own right. <laughs> How would we use it on our own? Well, for example, um, you went to a party last night, mm -hmm. and did you have a good time? Ah, uh, well, ish. So you're using the word ish to say, mm, it wasn't good, it wasn't bad. Right, OK, so ish by itself, and ish added on to uh, other adjectives mainly, I suppose. Mm. So we looked at about, sort of, kind of, um, we looked at ish. Now, I want you to try and use these different kind of um, vague words to describe someone. Um, who? Uh, how about, uh, you've got a new girlfriend, haven't you? Tell us about about her. Well, let's see, she's, um, I say, uh, she's, she's tallish. She's, she's, she's tallish. She's, uh, she's, she's about one metre seventy-five, so. More or less. More, more, more or less. There's another one. Okay, so she's tallish. Um, she's got, um, dark, well, mm, darkish hair, darkish, a little bit of red in there, so, so reddish hair. And uh, she's sort of, um, she's um, she's sort of shy. Do you know how old she is? Oh, and I, I well, it's, I, I, I haven't asked. I'm, I'm too much of a gentleman. <laughs> um, uh, I think, she, I think she's about, she's about thirty. I think. Okay. So moving away from my private life and back to Abba's speaking life, um, what else would you like to pick out for us? Well, I'd like to talk about what Abba actually said about the way people learn English in Sweden. Mm. They talked about improving your English by watching films in English, watching TV in English, listening to music in English. So I think all these things go to prove the point that we've talked about before, how important it is to get as much exposure to English as possible. We have so many English television programs, yeah. American, and we don't dub them, we subtitle them. So we read the Swedish 
words and listen to the English language mm -hmm. all the time. Um, Same thing with films, you know, and and they play records on the radio. They most of them are uh, English and American. So listening to and uh, hearing natural, real English through movies, television is, is is a good way of improving your English. It's a wonderful way and enjoyable too. So Richard, I wonder if briefly you could sum up those points for us. Well, um, I think it's very useful to employ some of this vague language when you're speaking words like ish or sort of or kind of. Um, it's very useful and it can make you sound a more interesting, more more natural kind of speaker. And also try to watch as much TV in English or listen to music in English and get as much exposure as possible. Maybe if you do that, you're going to get a wide range of vocabulary. You're going to be fluent. You're going to have good comprehension skills and good pronunciation and sound as good as ABBA. Richard, for today, thank you very much for those better speaking tips. Thank you. BBC Learning English dot com. Richard talked there about using vague language, describing something that's not exact. Remember, Benny from ABBA used the words like and about. It was about the same time when the Beatles became so popular. We sold like eight or nine golden records in Sweden. And Richard gave us a simple way to describe a colour that is not clearly one thing or another. We can say it's sort of brown or brownish. We asked a learner of English who's been studying in Britain if she had heard or uses such language. I'm not sure whether I've heard tallish or brownish, but I'm sure I've heard eightish and fiveish when our colleagues meant around eight o'clock and five o'clock. And I think this kind of language sounds very natural. Now, before we go today, if you didn't quite catch all of Richard's better speaking tips, don't worry. Here's a chance to hear them again. To sound more natural when you speak English, remember you can use vague language, words and phrases which show that you're not sure. For example, if you're describing a film, you can say, "It's a sort of adventure film." Or you could say, "It's a kind of adventure film." I think it's very useful to employ some of this vague language when you're speaking words like "ish" or "sort of" or "kind of."、Um, it's very useful, and it can make you sound more interesting, more more natural kind of speaker. Another very useful and natural sounding way to show that you're not able to be exact. Is to use the ending ish. For example, my father's hair is greyish. It's partly black and partly grey. It's greyish. If you're not sure of an exact time, you can say, the party starts at eightish. It's the same as saying that the party starts at about eight o'clock. At eightish. Take a tip from Abba and their fellow Swedes: watch English language TV and films, or listen to the radio or music in English. These will all help you to improve your spoken as well as general English language skills. Try to watch as much TV in English or listen to music in English and get as much exposure as possible. Maybe if you do that, you're going to get a wide range of vocabulary. You're going to be fluent. You're going to have good. Comprehension skills and good pronunciation, and sound as good as ABBA. BBC Learning English dot com presents Talk About English, a series of radio features that support your English language studies. This week we continue our series, Better Speaking, presented by Callum Robertson and featuring interviews with Richard Hallows. Let's start at the beginning. Abba, in fact, is the first letter of the Christian names of Anna Fried, Benny, Bjorn, and Agnita. That makes Abba. Yeah, right. But it started all, Benny, with the Hepsters, right? For me, it did. Yes.、Oh, well, it、you. started much earlier than that because my grandfather gave me an accordion when I was six years old. That's how I came into music. He played himself, and so did my father. Swedish superstars ABBA, who took their name from the first letters of the names of the four members of the group: Agneta, Benny, Björn, and Annafrid. 
In today's Better Speaking, we hear more from ABBA, and as usual, English teacher Richard Hallows will be with me to explain what makes the four members of ABBA such effective users of English as an international language. Richard will also be giving us some more advice on becoming better speakers of English. I think it's very useful to employ some of this vague language when you're speaking words like ish or sort of or kind of. And it's very useful and it can make you sound a more interesting, more, more natural kind of speaker. If you find it difficult to speak English and would like some help and advice on how to become more fluent and maybe one day use English as confidently as ABBA, then better speaking is for you. <laughs> ABBA were one of the most popular groups in many countries around the world throughout the 70s and early 1980s. We hear today an interview with the four members of ABBA, Agneta, Bjorn, Benny and Anna Frieda, or Frieda as she was also called, at the height of their fame. The interviewer wanted to know why they spoke such good English. Does English have that much effect on your life? We have so many English television programs, yeah. American, and we don't dub them. We subtitle them, so we read the Swedish words and listen to the English language mm -hmm. all the time. Um, Same thing with films, you know, and and they play records on the radio. There, most of them are uh, English and American. In Sweden, people learn English at school, and Swedes also watch a lot of English language television and films. The Swedish translation is not dubbed, not spoken over the English but appears as subtitles or writing at the bottom of the TV or cinema screen. So the audience can hear the English words as well as reading the Swedish translation. And there's lots of pop music too, in English, of course. So young people growing up in Sweden get to hear a lot of English. We have so many English television programs, yeah. American, and we don't dub them, we subtitle them. So we read the Swedish words and listen to the English language mm -hmm. all the time. Um, Same thing with films, you know. And and they play records on the radio there. Most of them are uh, English and American. ABBA weren't always called ABBA. The group's original name was the Hepstars. They were very successful in their home country of Sweden, selling more records than the Beatles at that time. The Hepstars, though, became ABBA. But where does that name come from? Let's start at the beginning. ABBA, in fact, is the first letter of the Christian names of Annafrid, Benny, Bjorn and Agneta, that makes ABBA. Yeah, right. But it started all, Benny, with the Hepstars, right? For me it did, yes. Oh, well, it you. started much earlier than that because my grandfather gave me an accordion when I was six years old. That's how I came into music. He played himself and so did my father. Well, tell us about the Hepstars. This was, what, 1962, the Hepstars? Yes, that's when we started. And uh, that was about the same time when the Beatles became so popular all over the world. And we were very well off. We sold like eight or nine golden records in Sweden. I think we outsold the Beatles by numbers, not by music. Benny, then how did you meet Bjorn? Well, we met on the road, actually. I was in, in the Hepstars, and he was playing in a folk group. The Hoot Nanny Singers. The Hoot Nanny yeah. Singers, yes. BBC Learning English dot com. Richard, ABBA, very successful international singing stars, but... Are they international speaking stars? Very much so. I think ABBA speak very fluently with great range of vocabulary, amazing speakers, really. What I'd particularly like to talk about today is the way they use vague language. And what do you mean by vague language? Well, when you, when you don't want to say something exactly, um, we use it also just for adding colour to your conversation, make yourself sound more interesting. Some examples I'd like to point out are when Benny says it was about the same time or we sold like eight or nine golden records. It was about the same time when the Beatles became so popular all over the world and we were very well off. We sold like eight or nine golden records in Sweden. I think we outsold the Beatles by numbers, not by music. So it's not being exact it's not being specific it's it's um sort of being vague exactly sort of is, is another way of being vague so we've got the examples there it was uh, about the same time uh, we sold like eight or nine so like and about what other expressions can we use to to add this vagueness color into our language okay well can why don't you um tell people what color my shirt is today ah okay um well it's it's kind of it's sort of 
red. Mm. It's um, it's not exactly red. I suppose it's um, could you say reddish? Reddish. reddish. It's reddish. kind of it's kind of red and it's brown, isn't it? Mm, Maybe we a, could say it's a it's a reddish brown. Reddish brown. Okay. Um, and also, I think I said it's sort of it's red. sort of also kind of. You also say yeah. Yes. So sort of kind of red. Reddish. This mm. issue is very interesting, actually. Mm. Uh, we can use it in, in loads of different ways. And such as? Well, um, ask me what time it is. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> what time is it, Richard? Well, I'm not wearing my watch, but I think it's tennish. Tennish. Uh, so you can add this on to, to, to any words? Uh, yeah, like I could say oldish or earlyish, or in fact, we can use ish on its own, just as a word in its own right. <laughs> How would we use it on our own? Well, for example, um, you went to a party last night, mm -hmm. and did you have a good time? Ah, uh, well, ish. So you're using the word ish to say, mm, it wasn't good, it wasn't bad. Right, OK, so ish by itself, and ish added on to uh, other adjectives mainly, I suppose. Mm. So we looked at about, sort of, kind of, um, we looked at ish. Now, I want you to try and use these different kind of um, vague words to describe someone. Um, who? Uh, how about, uh, you've got a new girlfriend, haven't you? Tell us about about her. Well, let's see, she's, um, I say, she's, she's tallish. She's, she's, she's tallish. She's, uh, she's, she's about one metre seventy-five, so... More or less. More, more, more or less. There's another one. OK, so she's tallish. Um, she's got, um, dark, well, mm, darkish hair, darkish, a little bit of red in there, so, so reddish hair. And uh, she's sort of, um, she's um, she's sort of shy. Do you know how old she is? Oh, and I, I well, it's, I, I, I haven't asked. I'm, I'm too much of a gentleman. Um, uh, I think, she, I think she's about, she's about thirty. I think. Okay. So moving away from my private life and back to Abba's speaking life, um, what else would you like to pick out for us? Well, I'd like to talk about what Abba actually said about the way people learn English in Sweden. Mm. They talked about improving your English by watching films in English, watching TV in English, listening to music in English. So I think all these things go to prove the point that we've talked about before, how important it is to get as much exposure to English as possible. We have so many English television programs, yeah. American, and we don't dub them, we subtitle them. So we read the Swedish words and listen to the English language all the time. Same and thing with films, you know, and, and they play records on the radio there. Most of them are uh, English and American. So listening to and uh, hearing natural, real English through movies, television, is, is, is a good way of improving your English. It's a wonderful way and enjoyable too. So, Richard, I wonder if briefly you could sum up those points for us. Well, um, I think it's very useful to employ some of this vague language when you're speaking words like ish or sort of or kind of. Um, it's very useful and it can make you sound more interesting, more, more natural kind of speaker. And also try to watch as much TV in English or listen to music in English and get as much exposure as possible. Maybe if you do that, you're going to get a wide range of vocabulary. You're going to be fluent. You're going to have good comprehension skills and good pronunciation and sound as good as ABBA. Richard, for today, thank you very much for those better speaking tips. Thank you. BBC Learning English dot com. Richard talked there about using vague language, describing something that's not exact. Remember Benny from ABBA used the words like and about. It was about the same time when the Beatles became so popular. We sold like eight or nine golden records in Sweden. And Richard gave us a simple way to describe a colour that is not clearly one thing or another. We can say it's sort of brown or brownish. We asked a learner of English who's been studying in Britain if she had heard or uses such language. I'm not sure whether I've heard tallish or brownish, but I'm sure I've heard eightish and fiveish when our colleagues meant around eight o'clock and five o'clock. And I think this kind of language sounds very natural. Now, before we go today, if you didn't quite catch all of Richard's better speaking tips, don't worry, here's a chance to hear them again. To sound more natural when you speak English, Remember you can use vague language, words and phrases which show that you're not sure. For example, if you're describing a film, you can say, it's a sort of adventure film. 
Or you could say, it's a kind of adventure film. I think it's very useful to employ some of this vague language when you're speaking words like ish or sort of or kind of. Um, it's very useful and it can make you sound more interesting, more, more natural kind of speaker. Another very useful and natural sounding way to show that you're not able to be exact is to use the ending ish. For example, my father's hair is greyish. It's partly black and partly grey. It's greyish. If you're not sure of an exact time, you can say, the party starts at eight-ish. It's the same as saying that the party starts at about eight o'clock. At eight-ish. Take a tip from ABBA and their fellow Swedes. Watch English language TV and films, or listen to the radio or music in English. These will all help you to improve your spoken as well as general English language skills. Try to watch as much TV in English or listen to music in English and get as much exposure as possible. Maybe if you do that, you're going to get a wide range of vocabulary. You're going to be fluent. You're going to have good comprehension skills and good pronunciation and sound as good as ABBA. BBCLearningEnglish.com presents Talk About English, a series of radio features that support your English language studies. This week we continue our series, Better Speaking, presented by Callum Robertson and featuring interviews with Richard Hallows. Yeah, I mean, those past few weeks have been amazing. I mean, before Paris, I wasn't even sure if I was supposed to play Paris because I wasn't in the best of conditions and, you know, back hurting a little bit and I didn't play a lot of matches in, in the past few weeks before that and and uh, what kept me really going was was really to, to get some match preparation to come here to Wimbledon. German tennis star Steffi Graf delighted at having one more chance to play in a Wimbledon final. Steffi obviously speaks English very well, but what is it that she's doing that makes her such a good communicator in English? What's her secret to better speaking? <laughs> German-born Steffi Graf was the most successful women's tennis player of the early 1990s. She won an amazing 21 major championships, including seven singles titles at Wimbledon. In 1999, which was her last year of playing professional tennis, she won the French Open Championship, even though she had had some injury problems and wasn't as fit and well-prepared as she should have been. And then she came to London and made it through yet again to the Wimbledon women's final. Steffi Graf was interviewed by the BBC after that semi-final match. Well, now you're through to uh, another Wimbledon final. I know they all are very special, but is this one particularly so? Because a month ago you would never have thought you'd be here as French Open champion and in a Wimbledon final. Yeah, I mean, those past few weeks have been amazing. I mean, before Paris... I wasn't even sure if I was supposed to play Paris because I wasn't in the best of conditions and, you know, back hurting a little bit and I didn't play a lot of matches in, in the past few weeks before that. And and uh, what kept me really going was was really to, to get some match preparation to come here to Wimbledon. And then I win the French and now I'm here in the finals. I mean, I can't ask of anything else. You just seem to be enjoying your tennis so much. Yeah, I I'm absolutely do so. I mean, there's... How how can how can't I? You know, I'm I'm I feel I'm I'm very happy to have reached what I've saw right now. BBC Learning English dot com. And with me again in the studio is teacher and teacher trainer Richard Hallows. Hello, Richard. Hello, Callum. Richard, Steffi Graf was a very successful tennis player, but is she a successful user of English as an international language? She's very successful. I mean, she communicates what, she, what she's saying very clearly. Um, what I'd, I'd like to talk about, uh, thinking about Steffi, is the way she sequences events when she's speaking. Sequences? OK, so, for example, uh, she makes it clear that one thing happened before or after another thing. She uses things like before Paris 
uh, and then I didn't play. And what kept me going? Then I went to the French、um, Open. So she's using words like before and then to make it clear the order of events. Before Paris, I wasn't even sure if I was supposed to play Paris because I wasn't in the best of conditions and. You know, back hurting a little bit, and I didn't play a lot of matches in in the past few weeks before that. And and、uh, what kept me really going was was really to to get some match preparation to come here to Wimbledon.、And、then I win the French, and now I'm here in the finals. I mean, I can't ask of anything else. So it's not just being done through using the simple past or the past perfect. It's not done through grammar. It's done through vocabulary. Yeah, you can just say, and, and we often do when we're speaking, use words and and then. These these two words are probably enough to communicate,、um, you know, the message, the idea. But it may be a little dull for the listener.、Mm. It may sound a little boring. So maybe we need to think of other ways of saying this. Okay. So could you just go over a few of those expressions again? Well, why not use first of all, then, then after that, or you could say afterwards, and finally. Um, uh, well, shall we try and give an example of how that might work? Okay. Well, you 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 have a think about. I'm going to tell you what I did、uh, this morning,、mm-hmm. and I'm not going to tell you the correct order. And see if you can maybe put them into the correct order using some of these、um, these words. Okay. I got up. I went to the pub. I went to work. I bumped into a friend, and、uh, I came to the BBC. Now, what did I do first and next and?、Okay. Um, let me see. Okay.、Uh, well, first you got up,、mm-hmm. and then you went to work. After that, you went to、uh, the pub, and while you were in the pub, you bumped into a friend, and finally you came to the BBC.、Mm. That's that's actually correct. So you went to the pub before you came here. I did, but I only had an orange juice. Ah, how very professional of you! <laughs> Now, very interesting. Actually, you use the word while.、Mm. Can you think why you use that word while? Well, because uh, uh, it, well, <laughs> because while you were in the pub, you bumped into the friend at the same time. At the as... same at the same time,、mm. which is very useful to be able to say something happening at the same time.、Mm. Now we could think of other words around this area. We've got words like. As soon as,、mm-hmm. or just as, which、uh, are all you know, are all around this same time. And what's what's the difference between those? Okay, while, or you could use when or as means at the same time. Just as means exactly the same time, and as soon as is when one thing happens immediately after another thing. How about an example then for as soon as and, and just as? Well, as soon as I arrived. Here today, I went and got myself a cup of coffee. So one thing happened immediately after you arrived.、Mm. You arrived. You got a cup of coffee. As soon as you arrived, you got a cup of coffee.、Mm. And just as I was arriving, I saw a colleague leaving. So you were arriving. You saw a colleague leaving at the same t- exactly the same time. So just as you were arriving, you saw a colleague leaving. Now. Moving on, or next, or, or after this, <laughs>、mm-hmm. are there any other things about Steffi's English you'd like to pick up?、Um, other things that I, I'd like to talk about Steffi are that she does make mistakes, and I'd like to reiterate, say again, this message that it's okay to make mistakes, and that I said at the beginning of the program that Steffi is a good communicator, and this is in spite of the, the small mistakes that she makes. The mistakes she makes are things with countables and word order and prepositions, things which don't affect. Her meaning, for example, she says,、um, "It kept me really going." Of course,、uh, this should be, "It really kept me going."、Uh, there's a mistake of countables. She says conditions, and it should be condition. And also, there's a mistake with a preposition. She says, "I couldn't ask of anything else." When it should be, "Ask for anything else." In fact, we also say,、um, "Ask for anything more." So these are mistakes that Steffi makes, but I don't think it's affecting her message, what she wants to say, what she wants to communicate. That's clear for us. And so, if you're communicating clearly and people get, they understand your message, that's what counts. That's what's important. And don't worry about these small mistakes. So communication is the key.、Mm-hmm.
Um, I wonder, Richard, if you could just summarise today's points for us. OK, well, we talked about sequencing, putting things in the correct order and using a variety of words, things like first of all, then, next, finally. We looked at um, using words like as soon as, just as or while to talk about things happening at the same time or around that time. And then we also talked about how Steffi makes mistakes, but she still communicates very effectively. And this is what our listeners really have to remember. Communication is the key. Richard Hallows for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. BBC Learning English dot com. We asked a few learners who are working hard at becoming better speakers whether they are afraid to make mistakes when they speak English. It was not my first language, so people make mistakes. And uh, uh, I think that people learn from their mistake. It's not a shame to make mistake. I think the most important thing is uh, to be understood by other people. And I think that uh, anybody uh, who is... that it is excusable to uh, make mistakes and nobody would uh, really be angry or upset if you do make mistakes. English is not my first language. I think it's reasonable to make mistakes as long as I can express my idea clearly. All the speakers there make the same point, that communication is most important and that they don't worry too much about making mistakes. After all, if you are not a native English speaker, then it's only natural to make mistakes. Now, before we go today, if you didn't quite catch all of Richard's better speaking tips, don't worry. Here's a chance to hear them again. When you're speaking English, make yourself easier to understand by using words which show clearly when things have happened. For example, if you're telling a story about something, use words like first, next, after that, and Finally, just like we heard Steffi Graf do. She makes it clear that one thing happened before or after another thing. She uses things like before Paris, uh, and then I didn't play, and what kept me going, then I went to the French um, Open. So she's using words like before and then to make it clear the order of events. Use expressions and words to show if two actions happen at the same time or very soon after each other. For example, while, just as, as soon as. While, or you could use when or as, means at the same time. Just as means exactly the same time. And as soon as is when one thing happens immediately after another thing. Even the best and most fluent speakers of a foreign language will sometimes make mistakes. So even if your level is not very high, don't worry when you're trying to speak English. The important thing is to make yourself understood, to communicate. And so if you're communicating clearly and people get, they understand your message, that's what counts, that's what's important. And don't worry about these small mistakes. LearningEnglish.com presents Talk About English, a series of radio features that support your English language studies. Today we conclude our series Better Speaking, presented by Callum Robertson and featuring Richard Hallows. The simple fact of the matter is this. If we cannot make globalization work for all, in the end it will work for none. Well, obviously I've survived in business by uh, being able to speak English and Greek, which is not very useful outside Greece. So definitely English must be the, the business language. So when everybody really, really liked debut, I was like, oh, but that's not, I can do much better than that, you know? So when I did post, for me, it's the sort of same concept, it, only I did it much better. We have so many English television programs, yeah. American, and we don't dub them, we subtitle them. So we read the Swedish words and listen to the English language all the time.
The issue that my parents had with me and my choice of profession was that they thought it was beneath me. They thought that I should have I had a higher calling, that I should have gone into politics. And they were just purely, simply disappointed in me. Voices of some of the famous people we've been listening to and learning from in this series, Better Speaking. In today's special final episode, Richard Hallows and I will be looking again at some of the things we've learned, some of the ways for you to become better speakers. So, Richard, here we are one more time. What are the main better speaking tips that you're going to highlight for us again today? Well, there are lots of different things we're going to be thinking about. Um, we've looked in the series at different strategies for communication. We've looked at different ways of dealing with vocabulary, organising it, etc. And um, we've also looked at different ways of maybe thinking about pronunciation, speaking more clearly. OK, now from those, let's start with what you call communication strategies. What, what should learners remember here, Richard? Well, I think the most important point, and this is something we've said, we've said again and again, is that you mustn't be afraid of making mistakes. If you want to communicate and you want to communicate effectively, it's OK to make mistakes. The point is to get your idea across to the listener. Now, now, many students might think, well, I don't want to make a mistake. If I make a mistake, that's wrong, that's bad. Well, I think if you're making so many mistakes that communication breaks down, that the, the listener doesn't understand, then that's one thing. But if you're making small mistakes, really don't worry about them. Keep going, don't stop. If you stop communicating, then the listener, you know, they're going to switch off, be a little bit bored. The idea is just get that message across. Don't worry about those small mistakes. They won't affect your communication. So communication is the most important thing. Absolutely. Well, let's, uh, let's hear a couple of listeners who talk about their attitude to making mistakes when they're speaking. I'm not afraid of making mistakes because I've learned from my mistakes. For example, when I was saying, I was making mistake in he or she. When I was talking about a man, he, I was saying that uh, she said like this, even though I knew that he's a man, but I was making mistake. But I was not shy because it was not my first language. And I, later on, I was correcting myself. I knew that it is mistake, so I, knew, I was never afraid of making mistake. English is not my first language. I think it's reasonable to make mistakes as long as I can express my idea clearly. Um, if you don't know where you made mistakes, you will never make progress. So both those speakers there were, were quite fluent and communicative in English, although they both said that because they're not native speakers, they're going to make mistakes, and that's part of the process of, of, of how they learn. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's absolutely the case. I might also remind listeners of a, a little trick that we thought of in one of the programmes where you focus sometimes when you're speaking on accuracy and sometimes on fluency. So sometimes when you're when you're out with your friends and you're you're socialising in the pub, you know, it's OK maybe to maybe for a small time think, all right, for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to think absolutely of every little grammar uh, point and speak absolutely correctly and do that sometimes. And then the rest of the time, let yourself go, relax, enjoy speaking and just communicate. Learners who, who are trying to improve their speaking obviously need to have a, a wide range of vocabulary but many students have the problem in that they, they don't know enough words or particularly they don't know uh, a word for a particular thing they're in a conversation and they want to talk about something but they don't know mm. that uh, that word now you had some strategies for dealing with that very common situation yeah i mean obviously vocabulary is key and you know if, if you have very few words you have to think well how can you use those few words you know, as effectively as possible. How can you communicate with those words? And so I think what our listeners need to think about doing is talking around a word, explaining what a word is. So if you don't know the word for something, well, just explain what it is. Do you, you know, use the words that you have to communicate your message. Well, here's Rafael, um, who's from Brazil, and, and he had the, the, the kind of problem you've just been describing there, uh, and he gets around it. Have a, have a listen to this and see if you can work out what was the word that he was having difficulty finding. I was in the bus, and I wanted to buy a ticket. I wanted to pay my fare, and I, well, I, I didn't have money, you know, coins, and the, the, the fare was just 70p, so I had to give a big bill to big note of money to the driver and but the driver di told me that he couldn't accept the, the note because he didn't have small 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 coins of 
you know, uh, to give me back the money I gave him. So the word that Raphael is trying to explain is change. Change, and and he he uses small money, and we understand completely what he wants to say. Now there are some useful uh, little expressions that you might use to help yourself explain uh, things. If you're explaining something, you could say it's the person who, for example.、Um, what do you call the man who、um, collects your money on the bus?、Uh, it's the driver. Yeah,、uh, well, it could be the driver, or there's the person who walks the, or around, the, or, or the conductor. Yeah, so we can say the person who.、Mm-hmm. We can say the thing that, or we can say the stuff. That we use stuff for uncountable nouns. Okay, can you give me an example?、Uh, so, what's that?、Uh, what do you call that white stuff that you use for cleaning your teeth? Toothpaste. Okay,、yes. there you go. So that's one way of not getting held up by words you don't know or can't remember. Talk around them. But what else can you do about this problem of not having enough words to express what you want to say to communicate without running out of words? Before on the program, I talked about I went to Spain. I went to see my friend、uh, Jon、mm. in Spain, and、uh, there had been an important football match. Now Jon always wants to talk about football, so I prepared the topic in my mind, and I thought of the likely words that I might need to talk about. So I thought of words like、um, goal and score and shoot,、mm-hmm. result, words like this. So what I'm talking about really is preparing vocabulary for likely situations. In an earlier program, we heard a, a good example of vocabulary being、uh, used around a, a specific topic, and that was Kofi Annan,、uh, Secretary General of the United、uh, Nations. Let's just hear that again. Try to imagine what globalization can possibly mean to half of humanity that has never made or received a phone call. The simple fact of the matter is this: if we cannot make globalization work for all, In the end, it will work for none. Now that e- example, Richard, I, obviously it was a scripted example. It was something that had been prepared before that he was speaking. But is there any anything we can still learn from this? Yeah, well, sure. As I said, I mean that is scripted, and we we don't go around with 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 scripts. But we are aware of the types of things that we talk about in certain situations. So it's always a good idea to be thinking, preparing in your mind what kind of things you might have to say, and this. Isn't necessarily just individual words, but it might also be like whole sections, whole chunks of words, whole whole chunks of language. And this idea of of using groups of words, chunks of vocabulary, we looked at when we were listening to Bjork. Bjork, a very good speaker of English. Here she is. I've always thought of debut and post as twins, and that's why I call them de- debut, which is before, and post, which is after. Sort of before and after my little lesson. And I think after this, I will move on to sort of quite sort of different things. But the the concept with both debut and post is a week in a life of a normal person, and all the ups and downs you have in one week, which you can't plan. So that was Bjork there, Richard. But what chunks of language was she using? You'd like to show us? There are a couple of、uh, very nice things that I think show that Bjork's also lived in England and, and has picked up some idiomatic language.、Uh, but she says she talks about the ups and downs you have in one week, and she she uses word before and after together. These words naturally co-occur, collocate in English, and and it's good to learn these words together. As a chunk, so they go together, ups and downs. Could you also say downs and ups? No, they only go in one direction, like、um, like a black and white film. Ah,、uh-huh. we wouldn't say a white and black film.、Mm-hmm. Now that kind of language is a little bit、um, idiomatic.、Um, on on the more common kinds of idioms,、mm-hmm. uh, any suggestions about the learning those? Learners often want to, you know, spend a long time learning idioms, and learning idioms can be, you know, fun. It's kind of a colourful side of English. But in fact, if you're intending to communicate with other non-native speakers, then chances of, you know, using idioms effectively and and your listener understanding quite small, really. And I would advise people to learn more common non-idiomatic language first, and then when you reach a higher level, maybe you know that's that's the time. And that was a point that was made in one of our earlier programs by Greek businessman Stelios Hadjiouanou. What I find fascinating is sometimes when you you are having perhaps even a, a casual meeting, even a dinner, with a group of、uh, people from different countries,、um, where you know the only common、um, link really is business.
and you try and talk outside the business, and, and, and then there's very little common ground. So um, one of the things I've learned is that um, if, if, if you're going to, to communicate with people whose mother uh, tongue is not English, don't try and use too many colloquial expressions, don't try and crack too many jokes, because it may go over their head completely and you may lose them. So idioms, slang and colloquial expressions may be very colourful, but they might not actually work with uh, people who've learnt their English in, in different parts of the world. Yeah, I think Stelios is making a, a, an excellent point there. I think, he, I think he's absolutely right. One thing I'd like to uh, point out about Stelios is the way he organises his language very effectively. He tells us, you know, what's coming next in the speech. For example, he says, um, what I find fascinating is, and well, everybody's, oh, oh what? what right, what's so he going to tell us, yes. you know? It's quite nice. So he organises very well, and that's something for listeners to think about when they're speaking. BBC Learning English dot com. But uh, Richard, we haven't mentioned pronunciation yet. We've said that communication is everything, but if pronunciation is is poor, then there may be no communication at all, or, or you may be misunderstood. Well, sure. I mean, I could talk about pronunciation, you know. We could do a whole series on pronunciation, but I think the most important advice uh, for listeners is to think about the sentence stress and the intonation that you're using. If there's one thing you're going to work on particularly, then think about how you stress certain words in your sentence and uh, which words are not so important. And also think about how the sentences might go up or might go down. Indeed. If you want to sound interesting, then in English we use a certain intonation pattern which may be similar or different to your language. It's important to know, be aware of the differences and, you know, adopt the English way of speaking. Well, sadly, that's all the time we have today, Richard, and that's all the time we have for this series. Thank you very much for your contributions, your help, your tips and your advice. And thanks, too, to all our celebrity better speakers. Well, we hope that this programme has helped you to go on to become a better speaker. BBC Learning English dot com presents Talk About English, a series of radio features that support your English language studies. Today we conclude our series, Better Speaking, presented by Callum Robertson and featuring Richard Hallows. The simple fact of the matter is this. If we cannot make globalisation work for all, in the end it will work for none. Well, obviously I've survived in business by uh, being able to speak English and Greek, which is not very useful outside Greece. So definitely English must be the, the business language. So when everybody really, really liked debut, I was like, oh, but that's not, I can do much better than that, you know? So when I did post, for me, it's the sort of same concept, it, only I did it much better. We have so many English television programs, yeah. American, and we don't dub them, we subtitle them. So we read the Swedish words and listen to the English language all the time. Mm -hmm. The issue that my parents had with me and my choice of profession was that they thought it was beneath me. They thought that I should have, I had a higher calling, that I should have gone into politics. And they were just purely, simply disappointed in me. Voices of some of the famous people we've been listening to and learning from in this series, Better Speaking. In today's special final episode, Richard Hallows and I will be looking again at some of the things we've learned, some of the ways for you to become better speakers. So, Richard, here we are one more time. What are the main better speaking tips that you're going to highlight for us again today? Well, there are lots of different things we're going to be thinking about. Um, we've looked in the series at different strategies for communication. We've looked at different ways of dealing with vocabulary, organising it, etc. And um, we've also looked at different ways of maybe thinking about pronunciation, speaking more clearly. OK, now from those, let's start with what you call communication strategies. What, what should learners remember here, Richard? Well, I think the most important point, and this is something we've said, we've said again and again, is that you mustn't be afraid of making mistakes. 
if you want to communicate and you want to communicate effectively, it's okay to make mistakes. The point is to get your idea across to the listener. Now, now many students might think, well, I don't want to make a mistake. If I make a mistake, that's wrong. That's bad. Well, I think if you're making so many mistakes that communication breaks down that the, the listener doesn't understand, then that's one thing. But if you're making small mistakes. Really, don't worry about them. Keep going. Don't stop. If you stop communicating, then the listener, you know, they're going to switch off, be a little bit bored. The idea is just get that message across. Don't worry about those small mistakes. They won't affect your communication. So communication is the most important. Thing. Absolutely. Well, let's、uh, let's hear a couple of listeners who talk about their attitude to making mistakes when they're speaking. I'm not afraid of making mistakes because I've learned from my mistakes. For example, when I was saying I was making mistake in he or she, when I was talking about a man, he, I was saying that、uh, she said like this, even though I knew that he's a man. But I was making mistake, but I was not shy because it was not my first language. And I later on I was correcting myself. I knew that it is mistake, so I know I was never afraid of making mistake. English is not my first language. I think it's reasonable to make mistakes. As long as I can express my idea clearly,、um, if you don't know where you made mistakes, you will never make progress. So both those speakers there were were quite fluent and communicative in English, although they both said that because they're not native speakers, they're going to make mistakes, and that's part of the process of 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 how they learn. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's absolutely the case. I might also remind listeners of a, a little trick that we thought of in one of the programs. Where you focus sometimes when you're speaking on accuracy and sometimes on fluency. So sometimes when you're when you're out with your friends and you're you're socialising in the pub, you know it's okay maybe to maybe for a small time think all right for the next ten minutes I'm going to think absolutely of every little grammar、uh, point and speak absolutely correctly and do that sometimes and then the rest of the time let yourself go relax enjoy speaking and just communicate. Learners who who are trying to improve their speaking obviously need to have a, a wide range of vocabulary. But many students have the problem in that they they don't know enough words, or particularly they don't know、uh, a word for a particular thing. They're in a conversation and they want to talk about something, but they don't know、mm. that、uh, that word. Now you had some strategies for dealing with that very common situation. Yeah, I mean, obviously vocabulary is key, and you know, if if you have very few words. You have to think. Well, how can you use those few words, you know, as effectively as possible? How can you communicate with those words? And so, I think what our listeners need to think about doing is talking around a word, explaining what a word is. So, if you don't know the word for something, well, just explain what it is. Do you, you know, use the words that you have. To communicate your message. Well, here's Rafael,、um, who's from Brazil, and and he had the the, the kind of problem you've just been describing there,、uh, and he gets around it. Have a have a listen to this, and see if you can work out what was the word that he was having difficulty finding. I was in the bus, and I wanted to buy a ticket. I wanted to pay my fare, and I well, I I didn't have money, you know. Coins and the 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 fare was just seventy p. So I had to give a big bill. To big note of money to the driver, and but the driver di- told me that he couldn't accept the, the note because he didn't have small 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 coins of you know、uh, to give me back the money I gave him. So the word that Raphael is trying to explain is change, change, and and he he uses small money. And we understand completely what he wants to say. Now there are some useful、uh, little expressions that you might use to help yourself explain、uh, things. If you're explaining something, you could say it's the person who, for example.、Um, what do you call the man who、um, collects your money on the bus?、Uh, it's the driver. Yeah,、uh, well, it could be the driver, or there's the person who walks the, or around, the, or, or the conductor. Yeah, so we can say the person who.、Mm-hmm. We can say the thing that. Or we can say the stuff that we use stuff for uncountable nouns. Okay, can you give me an example?、Uh, so, what's that?、Uh, what do you call that white stuff that you use for cleaning your teeth? Toothpaste. Okay,、yeah. there you go. So that's one way of not getting held up by words you don't know or can't remember. Talk around them. But what else can you do about this problem of not having enough words to express what you want to say to communicate without running out of words? 
before on the program I talked about I went to Spain I went to see my friend uh, Jon mm. in Spain and uh, there had been an important football match now Jon always wants to talk about football so I prepared the topic in my mind and I thought of the likely words that I might need to talk about so I thought of words like um, goal and score and shoot mm -hmm. result words like this so what I'm talking about really is preparing vocabulary for likely situations in an earlier program, we heard a, a good example of vocabulary being uh, used around a, a specific topic, and that was Kofi Annan, uh, Secretary General of the United uh, Nations. Let's just hear that again. Try to imagine what globalization can possibly mean to half of humanity that has never made or received a phone call. The simple fact of the matter is this. If we cannot make globalization work for all, in the end, it will work for none. Now, that e example, Richard, I, obviously it was a scripted example. It was something that had been prepared before that he was speaking. But is there any, anything we can still learn from this? Yeah, well, sure. As I said, I mean, that is scripted and we, we don't go around with, with, with scripts. But we are aware of the types of things that we talk about in certain situations. So it's always a good idea to be thinking, preparing in your mind what kind of things you might have to say. And this isn't necessarily just individual words, but it might also be like whole sections, whole chunks of words, whole, whole chunks of language. And this idea of, of using groups of words, chunks of vocabulary, we looked at when we were listening to Björk. Björk, a very good speaker of English. Here she is. I've always thought of debut and post as twins, and that's why I call them de debut, which is before, and post, which is after. Sort of before and after my little lesson... And I think after this, I will move on to sort of quite sort of different things. But the, the concept with both debut and post is a week in a life of a normal person and all the ups and downs you have in one week, which you can't plan. So that was Bjork there, Richard. But what chunks of language was she using you'd like to show us? There are a couple of uh, very nice things that I think show that Bjork's also lived in England and, and has picked up some idiomatic language. Uh, but she says she talks about the ups and downs you have in one week. And she, she uses word before and after together. These words naturally co-occur, collocate in English. And, and it's good to learn these words together. As a chunk. So they go together, ups and downs. Could you also say downs and ups? No, they only go in one direction, like um, like a black and white film. Uh -huh. We wouldn't say a white and black film. Mm -hmm. Now, that kind of language is a little bit um, idiomatic. Um, on, on the more common kinds of idioms, mm -hmm. uh, any suggestions about the learning those? Learners often want to, you know, spend a long time learning idioms. And learning idioms can be, you know, fun. It's kind of a colourful side of English. But in fact, if you're intending to communicate with other non-native speakers, then chances of, you know, using idioms effectively and, and your listener understanding, quite small, really. And I would advise people to learn more common non-idiomatic language first. And then when you reach a higher level, maybe, you know, that's, that's the time. And that was a point that was made in one of our earlier programs by Greek businessman Stelios Hadjioanu. What I find fascinating is sometimes when you, you're having perhaps even a, a casual meeting, even a dinner with a group of uh, people from different countries um, where you know, the only common um, link really is business and you try and talk outside the business and, and, and then there's very little common ground. So um, one of the things I've learned is that um, if, if, if you're going to, to communicate with people whose mother uh, tongue is not English, don't try and use too many colloquial expressions, don't try and crack too many jokes because it may go over their head completely and you may lose them. So idioms, slang and colloquial expressions may be very colourful, but they might not actually work with uh, people who've learnt their English in, in different parts of the world. Yeah, I think Stelios is making a, a, an excellent point there. I think, he, I think he's absolutely right. One thing I'd like to uh, point out about Stelios is the way he organises his language very effectively. He tells us, you know, what's coming next in the speech. For example, he says, um, what I find fascinating is, and well, everybody's, oh, oh what? what right, what's so he going to tell us, yes. you know? It's, it's quite nice. So he organises very well, and that's something for listeners to think about when they're speaking. BBC Learning English dot com.
But uh, Richard, we haven't mentioned pronunciation yet. We've said that communication is everything, but if pronunciation is is poor, then there may be no communication at all, or, or you may be misunderstood. Well, sure. I mean, I could talk about pronunciation. You know, we could do a whole series on pronunciation. But I think the most important advice、uh, for listeners is to think about the sentence stress and the intonation that you're using. If there's one thing you're going to work on particularly, then think about how you stress certain words in your sentence. And、uh, which words are not so important? And also think about how the sentences might go up or might go down. Indeed, if you want to sound interesting, then in English we use a certain intonation pattern, which may be similar or different to your language. It's important to know, be aware of the differences, and you know, adopt the English way of speaking. Well, sadly, that's all the time we have today, Richard, and that's all the time we have for this series. Thank you very much for your contributions, your help, your tips, and your advice. And thanks too to all our celebrity better speakers. Well, we hope that this program has helped you to go on to become a better speaker. BBC Learning English dot com presents Talk About English, a series of radio features that support your English language studies. This week we hear the first in our series, Better Speaking, presented by Callum Robertson and featuring interviews with Richard Hallows. This series, Better Speaking, is all about how you can become a fluent, confident speaker of English. In the programmes, we'll be hearing from learners of English from around the world, and also from someone who specialises in teaching speaking. Trainer Richard Hallows. Do you know some students do have this confidence, and they're the, the the students who really make the most progress and become, you know, the good speakers of English. The students who really don't progress so quickly are students who, you know, they worry about making mistakes so much it stops them really communicating and and making that progress. And there'll be more from Richard Hallows later in the program. But first, we hear from learners. What do you find most difficult about speaking English? We ask speakers from around the world. My difficult is the grammar because I didn't know to speak about past, present, and future. Now sometimes, and、um, you want to say something, but it's hard to say in English. You got the words, but it's hard to change it to English words.、So、sometimes it's difficult to say everything what you want to say. I don't like to speak English. Because I am afraid that I will make mistake and people will laugh on me. Yes, something I always found difficult was the pronunciation because I was afraid of pronouncing a word wrongly. So there are words I know, but I don't know how to pronounce, and that has、um, made me use less vocabulary. Students from around the world talk about the difficulties of speaking English. They feel afraid. They worry about correct grammar and pronunciation. Sometimes they can't find the right word. If these are your worries too, then you're not alone. Here at the BBC, we often get letters and emails from learners asking for advice. This one came from Jinping in China. I have learned English for almost 15 years. I have no problem with reading and listening, but speaking has always been a problem for me, because when I was at school. We always focused on grammar, vocabulary, and exams. Now I really want to improve my spoken English to a new level, achieve that free speaking in the near future. Do you have any good suggestions on how to achieve this? I will try anything which can help me achieve this. Jinping asks if we have any good suggestions to help her improve her spoken English. And over the next few weeks in better speaking, we'll be coming up with a few ideas. There'll be help and advice on becoming a more confident speaker, getting your meaning across, and improving pronunciation. You can also learn words and expressions that will help you to sound more fluent. BBC Learning English dot com. Helping us on the journey towards better speaking is teacher and teacher trainer Richard Hallows. Hello, Richard. Hi, Callum. Tell us what what do you think makes a good speaker of English as an international language? 
Well, I think there are lots of things, but most importantly, uh, you've got to have a good range of vocabulary and grammar. You need to know lots of words. The, the more words you know, the better, obviously. And similarly with grammar. The more grammar you have, the better you can explain yourself. And what other points? OK. Thinking about words. Now, which words go with which words? For example, um, knife and... Fork. Yeah, these words go together. Um, hopefully this programme will help listeners speak more fluently, not more smoothly. We say speak fluently. So the English is often made up of uh, expressions, words, groups of words that, that go together. Exactly. Um, we also need to think about pronunciation. Now, um, people, learners of English, often worry about speaking like a native speaker. I think this is important that they should realise this is not the way you need to speak. Most of the time, our listeners are speaking to other non-native speakers of English, so they need to be intelligible to those people. It's not necessary to have a native uh, accent. So you just need to speak so you can be understood without difficulty rather than sounding like a, a, a British gentleman or a British lady or something like that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And um, when we're speaking, sometimes maybe we need time to think about what, what we're saying. Um, rather than having a silence when you're speaking, um, you might like to say, um, hmm... In fact, I do this quite a lot when I'm speaking. And this, this helps you sound very natural and keeps the listener listening. So it's not bad English? Not bad English at all. It's very good English. And very natural. Mm, mm. Making you feel more, perhaps, confident when you're speaking also. So confidence is very important and it's not necessary to be accurate all of the time. Yeah, absolutely. Richard, do you find that most of the students that you teach have this kind of confidence? Do you know, some students do have this confidence and they're the, the, the students who really make the most progress and become, you know, the good speakers of English. The students who really don't progress so quickly are students who, you know, they worry about making mistakes so much it stops them really communicating and, and making that progress. And what can you do to help those students who, who may lack that confidence? You know, it's very difficult because maybe these students have felt like this all their learning careers, if you like. I, I sometimes tell students to sometimes think about focusing on, on fluency when they're speaking. And maybe if they want to focus on accuracy, thinking about that for maybe 10 minutes or something. So you're in the pub in the evening and I think, OK, for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to really think about my grammar or really think about my vocabulary. And at the end of that 10 minutes, relax, have a good time and enjoy speaking. Now, that's a good advice, but sometimes in a conversation it can be difficult to be fluent because you don't know what the word is for what you're trying to say. How c can students deal with that? Of course, this happens with all students, I think, unless you're, you know, very high level. I think the, the, the answer here is to not spend a very long time searching for that word. Don't sit there in silence. It's really boring for the person listening. You need to think of another word to express what you want to say. Or maybe the answer is a different grammar structure. But need to think around what you want to say and express yourself in a, in a different way. So different words which have the same meaning. Yeah, and if it's not perfect, it doesn't matter. It's all about communicating. So as long as people understand what it is you're trying to say, it doesn't really matter if you get exactly the right word or not if you can't find it. Exactly, yeah. And is there anything else that's a, a final piece of advice on the subject? Well, I think really key is, you know, you must enjoy speaking. Um, it's not an exam. It's just about communicating. And if you enjoy it, you will be so much better. So, Richard, to summarise those points, um, the, the first point? The first point is... Think about speaking accurately some of the time and then some of the time let yourself go, relax, enjoy, communicate. And the advice about vocabulary, if you can't think of the right word? Don't spend a long time searching for that word and having big silences in the conversation. It's horrible. Rather, think of another word. And the final piece of advice? Enjoy speaking English. It's fun. Richard Hallows, thank you very much. Thank you. And if you didn't quite catch all those tips, don't worry, here's a chance to hear them again. If you're worried about making mistakes when you speak English, then focus on accuracy, but only for a limited time, say 10 minutes. Then, after this fixed time, relax and just concentrate on being fluent and not worrying so much about making mistakes. 
If you're speaking in English and you don't know a word or phrase, don't stop and stay silent. If you can't think of the exact word, find another word or phrase which means the same thing. You need to think of ways of getting round the words and phrases you don't know by using simpler language that you do know. The key to increasing your confidence and therefore becoming a better speaker of English is to relax and enjoy yourself. Remember that speaking foreign languages should be fun.